Ready? All right, welcome everybody. My name is David Damore. I'm the executive director of the Lindsay Institute in Brookings Mountain West. Um, President has to keep going. He's got an, another commitment this morning. We wanted to have him say a few words as an expert, nationally recognized expert in mental health, and also a strong champion for mental health, particularly in light of the effects of COVID-19 and the December 6th tragedy on the UNLV community. President Whitfield. I thought you weren't going to clap for me. You guys were going to hurt my feelings. It is so nice to be able to spend just a little time with you all here today. I am so glad to see every one of you in this room on this topic. This is a topic, it's so funny, I've been having conversations about mental health, it seems like this week in particular. Um, and, and even going back, and I don't know if you all are gonna get to it, but I wanna say, I'm trying to do my memory right, in for Healthy People 2000, it was either 2000, 2010, it was the first time that mental health actually got brought into the conversation about health. And they did, there's a very nice supplement, I wanna say it's 2000. Um, there's a very nice supplement that the Surgeon General wrote that said, hey, we don't seem to know enough about mental health, and oh, there's all of these outcomes that ultimately influence virtually everything about life when mental health is ignored and not paid attention to. We don't do that here at UNLV. We have absolutely fantastic people doing great work and they're here in this room. Um, so today's showcase is gonna have three important initiatives that it's going to be talked about. Um, the UNLV practice, which is interesting. When I got here and my research is on mental health, so what did I do? I got here and started looking around to see, you know, where are the mental health people? And Michelle Paul, who is nothing, whatever, is, is this little person with this, <laughs> with this incredible, incredible reach and vision for how the university can actually impact the community as well as train the next generation of mental health folks. There's also Be Here Nevada that Sarah Hunt does. Um, this is a new statewide initiative that's being led from UNLV. This is the kind of thing that I actually envision our university being able to do, is to not only help and change things in our community, in Southern Nevada, in the Valley, but is to make it statewide. And then thirdly is MTSS, a school-based service delivery that Chris Kearney is going to talk about. And this maps out and connects mental health services for kids in Clark County. Um, I'm such a fan of, the, it's, what is it? It's not GPS, it's, there, there's, there's a way in which you can map things and actually take a look at what's going on. Because sometimes as we go from community to community, we don't get the full impact because you can't always see everything that's going on in every single household. So using that type of methodology, you actually see the true impact and the breadth of the actual issues that you're addressing. These three programs featured today really are having an impact that's going to change Southern Nevada. Um, I'm always careful to say this, but they know I support this um, wholeheartedly. Um, our campus is in significant need of us being able to continue to work on mental health. I hope that all of you all have been able to see Rebel Recovery, as you will see in there. Um, it's, if it's not first, it's the second thing. I think we start with communications, but we talk about mental health. We have to be able to reduce the stigma around mental health. And to some degree, as we build a workforce, as we have these kinds of important conversations, that's what we will do. We will be able to reduce stigma so that people in need ask for help. But when they ask for help, we gotta be ready. So you all are going to deal with, talk about that today, um, trying to get some more people to be able to pursue um, careers in mental health. I'll tell you that I think it's this year. I celebrate 35 years having studied mental health and being a mental health researcher, um, particularly in African Americans. Um, and it's been part of the most rewarding part of my life. And, and the only thing I'll say is that be careful because once you get in it, you get hooked. <laughs> and, and I am hooked. Actually, I was writing part of a grant yesterday in between meetings and I said, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm the president, I'm not supposed to be writing, you know. I, I only got given a quarter of a page. And actually, I wrote a whole page <laughs> off the top of my head. And it's in part because you do become passionate about something that you can have an impact on. You all can each have an impact on mental health of our colleagues, our friends, our neighborhoods. So have a great 
time today. I was told that this is going to be recorded. Leave my part out, but I want to see all the rest of it. Have a great day, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And if our efficient parking services get you, that's the guy to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a quick announcement. If you are interested in getting continuing education credits, this is going to be the process. Please sign in for attendance. After the event, get your certificate of participation. There is also, make sure you have a program agenda and the learning objectives insert. And then you can uh, send that to your professional licensing board. I'll remind you at the end as well. Um, just a couple of, uh oh. Just a little bit about the Lindsay Institute, if you're not familiar with us. We were established in 2009 with a generous grant from the Lindsay Foundation. We have six main research areas. Economic development, education, governance, health, nonprofits, and social services. We either conduct research ourselves or we uh, will commission re work in those areas to address and use that to, to frame issues and to try to lay foundations for policy interventions there. Some examples of some recent work we've commissioned, uh, a piece by Brad Wimmer over economics looking at how Nevada can deploy its federal broadband dollars effectively. And then some guy named Trip Umbach, um, some firm named Trip Umbach here, did an analysis for us a few years ago on the in, uh, economic impact of a UNLV academic Health Center. We're also working with uh, the Trip Umbach firm to uh, do an analysis of the need for and the sustainability of a standalone children's hospital, which will be out later this spring. So one of the main ways in which we convey our uh, research is through the data hub. These are fact sheets and data visualizations. Um, go back that pull out data from national analyses focusing on Nevada, the Mountain West, and of course Las Vegas. And across the 11 collections, uh, the recent numbers say we've had 45,000 downloads from the data hub. So, yeah. Um, and we have in the health collection three mental health specific um, fact sheets there, one looking on the state of the mental health across the Mountain West, one looking at children's uh, youth mental health, and then one looking at mental health provider deficiency areas. I just wanna go quickly through these to highlight some data points here to set up the presentations that follow. <coughs> so the first big takeaway here Nevada's ranks 51st in overall mental health here. These data are a few, few years old, but there was a study that came out just this week telling the same, same story here. And you can see across the Mountain West here, highly deficient compared to say the Northeast um, in, in, and up into um, New England there. And these are essentially looking at two, two big main, main factors, the prevalence of mental health there. You see Nevada ranks 46th. And then, of course, access to care. And these data suggest that the ratio of providers to, uh, to, 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 to the mental health workforce availability is 460 to 1 on this one there. Um, we also take a look at some of the youth mental health here. And in this case, we, we looked at some overtime data here and looking at essentially the youth um, reporting at least one major depressive episode across the, the states in the Mountain West there. And you see across all the states in the Mountain West, it's increasing, particularly you see the spike during COVID-19, uh, the effect of COVID-19 there. We also took a look at some of the uh, major depression in youth across the Mountain, the mountain West here. Um, about 300,000 K through 12 students in the Mountain West states have major depression, including nearly 8% of children in, in Nevada here. And in Nevada, approximately two thirds of the K through 12 students with major depressive aid do not receive treatment. And then we wanna take a look at the workforce part of this here, right? Looking at the ratios here on the left in the gray column is the recommended ratios there. No state in the Mountain West has the recommended ratio of school psychologists, social workers, and, so, and school counselors there. In Nevada, has the lowest availability of social, school social workers among Mountain West states there. Ratio of one to 8,730 students. 
and we have about 26% of the uh, recommended number of school psychologists and less than 3% of the number of school social workers there. So we need to build this pipeline as we'll talk about today. Last thing is looking at um, some of the, the, de the deficiency areas here, right? And you can see that Nevada has 235, uh, we need 235 additional practitioners, and this is looking largely at the ratio of psychiatrists to, 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 to high demand uh, populations out there. Nevada requires the largest number of mental health care practitioners to eliminate these designations of essentially mental health um, deserts there. So as you can see, lots and lots of work today, and that's why we are here today to look at what UNLV faculty are doing to try to improve, improve these outcomes here. First up, we have the, uh, the UNLV practice looking at their four-year strategic plan. I'm gonna hand it over to Paul Ambach, who is the president and founder of Trip Ambach. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's baseball season, <laughs> and my team, the Pittsburgh Pirates, are six and one. And that's really amazing, because we've been the worst team in baseball over the last 30 years. <laughs> and we have the smallest payroll, but somehow in the months of April and May, we usually do pretty well. And I'm really excited to tell you that the Pirates, with such a small payroll, are doing very, very well. I want you to think about the US healthcare delivery system as a team, and first thing I want to tell you is that they have the largest payroll of any healthcare delivery team in the world. They have a $5 trillion payroll if you also include all the social and human services as part of the healthcare delivery. So what I'm going to call human care is a $5 trillion uh, industry. So you'd think the team would be really good. And one of the things we like about baseball is how highly specialized and skilled the players are. Do you know, we have a pitcher, uh, Chapman's his last name, who can throw a ball 104 miles per hour. Can you imagine the training? And this guy's not young. He's been doing this for 12 years. And the work that it takes to be that specialized to throw a ball 102 miles an hour on every pitch. And we love to watch how highly skilled and specialized people are. And if you look at first baseman, they actually have a special glove because they have to dig the ball out of the dirt. And first baseman, well, they have to also catch the ball, get to the bag, step on the bag, and they practice that all the time. You also have shortstops that have to dive out in the outfield sometimes to catch the ball. Catchers that have to catch a 102-mile-an-hour ball, often in the dirt. Sometimes they have to tag people when they come home. Highly specialized. So you might expect that for $5 trillion, these highly specialized people in the United States would have the best team in the world. But we're last in the world. We're dead last in the world. We're a team with a $5 trillion payroll that loses almost every day. Why? Well, it's because the players train in their individual positions but they hardly ever get a chance while they're training to play with others. So it'd be like if you said to a bunch of pitchers, catchers, shortstops, and third basemen, today we're gonna play baseball, and we're gonna get out in the field, and we're gonna play together, and you're gonna get the ball, and you're gonna throw it to that person, then you're gonna throw it to that person, then you're gonna catch the ball, then someone's gonna try to get to second base, you're gonna throw it to them. Well, because of that dysfunction in playing, we don't have the outcomes that we expect. So today, I got to thinking, instead of a $5 trillion payroll, what would happen if we divided the country into 100 teams? And I can't do the math, but let's say that's $50 billion in each of the teams. Uh, could they do a better job than the national team if we had a Southern Nevada team? Now, I understand, and we're going to hear later uh, from Sarah, that there's a team in Omaha the Nebraska team's doing pretty well. We've been looking out across other teams, and we've kind of noticed that there's some that are starting to play a little better as a regional team versus the national team. I think the national team is hopeless. It's never going to win. And with all that payroll, it's really a shame. But for the local team, I'm introducing now my friend, Dr. Michelle Paul, and she's been the, the captain of a, a scrappy team, 
at the practice, and they've put together um, a plan that my company was able to help with. And I'm gonna introduce Michelle right now to come up, come on up. And she's gonna tell you about the team that has been assembled and the plan that this team has for a lot less than $50 billion, I can tell you that, <laughs> to, to make a very big impact. I'm gonna take my hat off, but uh, hey, root for the Pirates, they're terrible. <laughs> They'll lose 100 games this year, but thank you. Michelle. Thank you. I'm gonna go on this side, sure and you're gonna go on this I just wanna make sure I can get these slides to advance. It's a sticky, sticky. Sticky, sticky. Well, <clears throat> that's gonna make it hard for me to walk around, but I'll do it. There you go. <laughs> President Whitfield reminded me of my one of my very first speaking engagements. I was in 1985, I was 17 years old. They put me behind a podium on top of a wooden Coca-Cola crate <laughs> to stand on. It was at the Moose Lodge in Governor, New York. I'm from way upstate New York. Love Governor. Yeah. I've been to There's a great county fair there. I grew up on a dairy farm, and I was speaking on behalf of the dairy industry and advocating for my family's industry. And I no longer stand on Coke boxes. <laughs> I have heels for that, and but I also try to get out away from the podium. But I'm, and I'm but I'm still advocating, and I'm advocating for mental and behavioral health since I moved here to Nevada in 1997. So let me tell you a little bit about UNLV practice and our story before we launch into our strategic plan. Many of you may be wondering, what is UNLV practice? Well, first of all, I want to recognize any of my staff or alumni that are in the audience today. Just give you a shout out and just raise, raise mm -hmm. your hand. Give me a wave. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> UNLV practice is the partnership for research, assessment, counseling, therapy, and innovative clinical education. OK. And uh, right about back in about 2009, you all might remember the economic downturn of that time. And colleges uh, across the university and programs doing mental and behavioral health training across the university were you know, forced to tighten their belts. But there was an opportunity there to pool resources and pull together a proposal to create a, an interdisciplinary community mental health training clinic. So in the department, I'm sorry, in the College of Liberal Arts, we had clinical psychology doctoral training happening. And we have the chair of that department over here and the program coordinator back there. Mm -hmm. And then in the College of Education, we had master's and doctoral school psychology folks being trained and mental health counseling folks being trained. Anybody from the College of Education here today? Wave, raise your hand. Yes, a couple people. So how about we pool our resources and pull together and develop this community mental health clinic? And so the provost at that time said, you go for it, and gave us some seed funding to put together a training clinic. And at UNLV practice, since 2012, we've been offering community-facing affordable, low-cost, sliding scale, evidence-based mental and behavioral health services, individual and group psychotherapy, and psychological assessment and testing services for all ages, as well as telehealth services to northeastern Nevada, Elko, and Humboldt counties through a wonderful partnership with communities and schools, and I see Tammy there. And that's been an amazing partnership, so much so that we were able to pivot completely to a telehealth environment within three days in March, what was it, about March 15th, 2020, when the governor said, get ready to go home, everyone. We did, and we didn't have a lapse in training or a lapse in service because of that amazing partnership that we've been doing telehealth for almost 10 years up until that point. Mm -hmm. So building on our success, um, and with the great support of our university leadership, we, we've heard from President Whitfield, um, who's a psychologist, Provost Heavey, a psychologist, our VP of Health and Dean of the Kirk Corian School of Medicine, Dr. Kahn. Um, they believe deeply in positioning mental and behavioral health alongside physical health. And we were asked to go ahead and expand our vision 
and we had uh, some great donor support from the community. We have support from the Kagi Foundation, the, Fe the Shear Family Foundation, and the Engelstadt Foundation, and I know some of our representatives from those foundations are here today. <clears throat> this is my opportunity to thank you. We were able to develop a post-degree training program. We were also able to develop a satellite clinic um, in the heart of Las Vegas's medical district at Charleston and Rancho. And it's there where we offer our youth and family facing um, mental and behavioral health services. With that increased infrastructure, uh, one of our esteemed faculty members who is a, an amazing researcher in the field of early, mental, early severe mental illness, Dr. Dan Allen, who I don't think is here today, but we want to give him a shout out. He came to me and he said, I'd like to build on this. I'd like to develop some coordinated specialty care programming and do some training in this area and work on developing some innovative models for early identification and intervention for young people who show signs of potential bipolar illness developing or clinical high risk for psychosis developing. And we also partnered with communities and schools to do rural outreach to develop coordinated specialty care, not only for folks locally, but in those um, counties where we already have partnerships. And um, I think that's all I want to say about that, but that's really cool, right? So <laughs> we want to, that expanded vision of bringing together all of those different disciplines uh, we firmly believe that that interdisciplinary training is key for developing our professional workforce. Our students get to work together and learn together in each discipline. In mental health, we have a lot of overlap, but we also have a lot of unique um, perspectives that when we come together holistically, each of those facets creates, I think, a beautiful diamond, and our students are better prepared to b go out into the workforce. So we want to keep going. So with that, we did, um, a President Whitfield said, let's see if we can envision something a little bit bigger, a mental health institute that pulls in as many of the mental and behavioral health training programs in, in a coordinated way as possible. And I and my colleague, Dr. Hunt, who you'll hear from in a little bit, um, talked about how we would do that. And the president and the provost said, you know what? Build on UNLV practices success and start there in developing this institute idea. So with the amazing support of Intermountain Health, we were able to get a development grant. So let me back up a little bit and talk a little bit more about this idea of UNLV practice as a unifying voice. Under academic health, we have several schools. You can see the School of Medicine, School of Dental Medicine, Integrated Health Sciences, School of Public Health, School of Nursing. There's no school of mental health. One of the challenges in mental health is the fact that our disciplines are peppered or distributed or scattered or fragmented. Choose your word. Um, they are specialized, but they're not practicing together. They're not playing ball together in a systematic, cohesive way. And so how do we make sure that that mental health voice is represented alongside our esteemed colleagues in the other areas underneath the academic health initiative. That is the job of UNLV practice. And I was asked to take on not only the executive directorship, but also to be um, appointed assistant vice president of mental and behavioral health at UNLV to do just that, to be that person that is rallying everybody to coordinate and get together. And we're talking specifically about <clears throat> our non-medical mental and behavioral health units, clinical and school psychology, mental health counseling, social work, couple and family therapy. And this is not to say that we don't, we don't want to say that our medical partners in psychiatry and psychiatric nurse practicing um, are left out of that equation at all. It's just about making sure that all mental and behavioral health facets are represented underneath the academic health initiative. And in fact, couple and family therapy technically, administratively lives in the School of Medicine with psychiatry. So our job, hmm. our mission, if we were to choose to accept it, is that the mm -hmm. mission impossible? But not mission impossible. <laughs> 
was to strategically unite mental and behavioral health training programs for the greatest impact. When we are integrated, we are better together. Um, and we can tackle mental, Nevada, we believe that we can tackle Nevada's mental health crisis or be a big player in that solution to that problem by working together. So let me talk a little bit, just, I just wanna make sure everybody understands the, how comprehensive the strategic planning process was. I, if you didn't get a, one of the strategic plans, they're, um, coil bound, they're coil bound. How are we doing on time, Dave? Just wanna check. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there it is, up there. I have until 9.40. Oh, we're good. Okay. Uh, you know, when, when something becomes laminated and in color and coil bound, you have to do it, right? Uh, so the timeline, just about this time last year, we kicked off with President Whitfield and Provost TV, you know, saying, yes, go. And we put together a really robust strategic planning committee. And then over the summer, we did a national practice review. Uh, spoiler alert, nobody is doing this like we are. So we get to be first and um, best, uh, right? And we identified and interviewed a bunch of stakeholders, and I'll, I'm gonna list their names in a minute. We tried to rep, get representation from as many stakeholder voices as possible. Uh, Trip Umbach did over 40 hours of interviewing this summer. We had an in-person committee meeting to plan and develop draft goals and strategies in the fall, followed by a remote planning session with spending time then diving into the specific tasks, and the plan was delivered finally just in December and early January so that we could present it to you here today. I just wanna take a minute and recognize all of the people that participated. This is our strategic planning committee. We have representation from UNLV, administrative leadership, of course our deans, uh, research representation, development, um, our training coalition, our operations voice, and our representatives from our community partners as well. And then these are our stakeholders and contributors that participated in those interviews. And I want to take a moment, if I had a moment, but I'm on a clock, to recognize every single one of you and at least make eye contact with you through my presentation today. So there was a clear consensus. This group said, this should be your vision. And I, uh, Paul and I both don't like reading to people. No, we don't. But this we thought was important to read out loud and just really let it sink in. UNLV practice will be recognized locally, regionally, and nationally as a center of excellence for its innovative, bold, and uniquely interprofessional, integrated, and collaborative design and culture by transforming the fragmented nature of mental and behavioral health. It will serve as a premier model in Nevada and beyond, bringing together mental and behavioral health care alongside physical health care to improve complex psychosocial outcomes. Mm -hmm. Woo. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, when we started the plan, one of the things, and Michelle's gonna take you through it, I'm gonna talk a little bit more, was what are the things that really root this plan so it can last and be implemented and be really um, transformative? And Michelle's gonna tell you about the heart part of this and we're gonna get into the objectives. Right. So the heart part, we're gonna connect, right? We're gonna take, away, take ourselves from disconnection to connection. We're gonna take ourselves um, through Oh my golly, I'm having a senior moment, everybody. Give me a second. <laughs> Michelle needs to remember her guiding principles. The key take the key takeaway is Michelle forgets her guiding principles. That's what the, that's what it's gonna be. No. Well, I think our, I think it's <laughs> Sorry, hit the, connection hit, hit, <laughs> to collaboration. Hit, down, hit the button and, and keep innovation. going. Light bulb. Right. So we're not gonna we're not gonna redo what we've always been doing. Right? Stop doing what's been not been working. We're going to innovate into the future. So. so in all plans, and it's my fault. I jumped in when I saw the heart wanted to say something, and that threw us off. Um, take two. <laughs> all plans have to start with objectives. And I always say there's a bunch of P's involved in everything. There's people, 
in a place with a purpose. But if you don't have what Michelle has, which is passion, and you're not able to connect with people, these key objectives get lost. And I think one of the things that's so important was the, the diligent coordination and the fact for us to start really thinking about this as an ongoing process of implementation, not a plan. So this is when the team got together and said, how are we gonna play and how are we gonna make this work? Um, <clears throat> but it really requires a cultural change uh, by building upon the strengths and respecting the other folks in the room. And, and that is something that really gets the team to start to buy into winning together. Next slide. And you can also see that the trainee ecosystem is really important. And those are fancy words for getting players to come and learn how to play and stay on the team, be good players that understand how to play with others, but to make sure that we're keeping them on the team. And then to start to think broader with policy change. And one of the things that's so important on the policy and on the financial foundation is that it's bigger than just those that are training, doing research, and doing clinical practice on the field. It's the ownership of the system. It's the understanding by the owner. Who are the owners in this? Well, the owners are the people, the residents, the taxpayers, but the owners are also the state, the city, the county. Uh, these are folks that we have to advocate for to make sure our team uh, can continue to be effective. And we also need the financial resources mm -hmm. to be able to do that. So those are the objectives driving the plan. <clears throat> so our first goal was really the, the, the most difficult in some ways, and that was to create a collaborative partnership among everybody uh, as a center of excellence. And Michelle did a nice job of kind of giving you the history of how it took to get there. And one kind of interesting thing to me is how much work it takes just to get a university to, to work together, and then worse, to then have it connect with a community, and then to make it have a strategy that can be uh, effective. So we have a lot of years to even get the first goal to happen. Uh, so we'll move to the next goal. All right. But it happened. Yeah. We have a plan. Our second goal is community care excellence. And we've already really started on that goal for the last 10 years. That's what we've been doing is providing community care um, on a sliding scale basis. You know, that's our goal. Increased access to evidence-based affordable care while training the next generation workforce. And to date, for 10 years, if you think about it, we've spent, we've trained on average 30 or more graduate students a year out into the workforce and served. Um, <laughs> if on average we see five to 600 unique individuals per year and about 6,000 hours of, of services, you can do that math. <clears throat> but now our job is to do, you know, to take it to the next level, bring in more providers. And one of the things that we do, I just wanna give you a taste of some of what we do that's really cool. We have interdisciplinary case rounds every single week. So our, our students will round together from different uh, theoretical perspectives and disciplinary perspectives on every case that comes into the clinic. And they get to have more brains involved in each of those. So if you have a kiddo coming into the clinic, the school psychology student will say, well, what about school? And the mental health counseling student will talk about maybe some psychosocial determinants of health or social justice issues. And the clinical psychology students will also bring in their unique perspective. Mm -hmm. And our supervisors work together as well. So we'll also do outcome-driven care. So we're training our students in monitoring outcomes at every single session so that we can revise the treatment plan as we go. Mm -hmm. which I know those of you who are out there in the world of value-based care know that that's those are critical skills and we're training our students to do that now. Mm -hmm. The stakes are so high and if you think about Dave's presentation and some of the data, real lives are at stake. People die, people fall through the cracks. So when we talk about community care coordination, it's not an academic exercise, it's actually a real life challenge for everybody in this room and everybody outside this room. So when we have that as a goal, that goal means that there is a drastic need for this. 
that this plan has to work, it has to be scalable, because the needs are so, so great and growing all the time. So there's a, there's a real urgency. But at the same time, another goal is the research agenda and a combination of researchers together. Researchers are like in Pictionary, all play. Research works better when everybody works together. And one of the things that's so important in the research and best practices in clinical training is for us to learn better through research how to scale up for this tsunami of mental health and behavioral health needs that we have and to think differently and more creatively about the solutions. So there's a practical level. So when I say research, and a lot of you people are probably thinking, oh, that's the stuff that happens in wet labs, and that's the stuff that have. Well, in this case, this is the stuff that's gonna make or break how effective we are at making the changes we need. And it takes a bunch of people around working together in an interdisciplinary way. So that goal is an important part of all of the goals. It doesn't sit out like, oh, there's that research goal. I guess we'll put it in somewhere. We think it's critical to scaling and effectively having the outcomes that are necessary to change the needle. And I'll just underscore right now that we have some robust service grants going on that early severe mental illness um, initiative. And the research is happening alongside. So it's an innovative model. They're collecting data as we go and putting that research into practice yeah. and practice into research and yeah. reaching it out into the community. I wanted to make sure I mentioned that we have community partners with NAMI, for example, very intimately involved with that project. So what should a university be doing? We should be making sure that our, we are pushing things forward through our research while we're practicing and learning and it's an iterative process and we're really proud of that commitment. So then the, the fourth goal is what we've talked about at the very beginning about getting players on the field, getting them trained, getting them to stay, getting them to be the best at what they do. And we feel that training the workforce is probably the biggest challenge that we have. And I know some of the work that Lindsay has done recently in those briefs that you can see online really speak to this um, almost insurmountable challenge. And so how do you deal with this? Well. One of the ways is to really work across the whole university uh, ecosystem and the community ecosystem to leverage uh, the partners that we have that aren't just the trainees that we have academically, but to connect them through this web of folks. And my niece, uh, Jenny, uh, is in this industry. She works with uh, homeless folks. She lives near Container Park. Uh, every time I see her, we have to walk down Freeman Street and see all of her friends. Uh, I've met a lot of her friends, and and she's in this ecosystem, but she doesn't even know about the practice. And I told her about Michelle. I said, "Got to meet my friend Michelle," and she goes, "Uncle Paul, I'm so busy just trying to keep up with the the, the demands of being a caseworker in mental health in the and on the streets of of Las Vegas. Uh, how do I connect?" Well, that's all part of this broad spectrum of training opportunities. So it's not just training the people that are signed up for classes. How do we create a training environment that goes out throughout the valley to all the people in the workforce? So the team has to get bigger, and it's not gonna get big enough, fast enough, for just the people that we train ourselves. So this is a big vision, I think, for this goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want, this is, I want to take a minute to shout out, I already talked about our couple and family therapy folks, but we have the clinical director, the clinic director, Don Moore, of the couple and family therapy program, and they have a training clinic. So we've had some preliminary conversations about how can we pool ourselves together and merge so that our students can be learning with each other so the community knows where to go for mental and behavioral health care, and we're doing it in a coordinated fashion. And I think this is why we're all here, the last goal. And this is a plea and, a, and an invitation so to- The second to last goal. The second to I last goal. I got one goal. more. Oh, you got one more. Uh, this goal, oh, you do have six, that's right. This goal, we did rehearse. We did two Zoom calls. Um, this, this, we talked most of the time about other things. But, we talked about uh, baseball. We talked a lot about baseball. But, but if we can't get the lift on the policy side and the government relations side 
and we can't get a fan base that understands that this is the way to win and this is the best thing for the economy, for the uh, community and the social benefit and just the economic impact. And this is the thing we're nationally known for is economic impact, uh, our company, is showing what it really costs and how much it can save if we can coordinate healthcare better, especially in the behavioral and mental health area. And uh, President Whitfield said that it was almost like 25 years ago we realized that mental and behavioral health had something to do with health, which is crazy. And then we thought to think about the fact that it could actually impact our health outcomes, crazier still. And then we get to the point where we're like, oh my gosh, we're so behind in this, we'll never catch up. Well, the people in uh, uh, Carson City, the people in Washington, D.C., and the people right here at the city of Las Vegas, and I know we have our, our pro tem mayor here today, and we have people that we've connected with in Clark County and the city. They have to all know and advocate for mental health and behavioral health, uh, and, and they need to know that a team is formed and the team needs support. Mm -hmm. Number six. Yeah, how many of us have been here for 25 years or more? Okay. So we're ready. We've been waiting, yeah. right? We've been waiting my, and I'm we're ready. I'm in my ready. 61st year. My <laughs> first presentation was from the baby warmer. <laughs> I thanked the nurses and my mother. So our last goal is financial, financial sustainability. So we're excited to try to diversify and solidify our revenue streams. Um, yeah. You know, building that is off. That an important one. Why did I forget number six? It's, <laughs> Paul. The money. It says yeah. right here on the screen. Oh, yes, if you don't have the money, uh, no mission, no margin, but you also need to have money that's sustainable. And while it's great to get gifts, uh, and I know that uh, this project was supported by Intermountain Health, they gave a gift for the project, but how do we build long-term sustainable funding for this? Yeah, and I tried to not use my notes, but for this, I wanna go back to my notes. We've been under-resourced and un under-prioritized for decades, and so mental health initiatives are not exactly known for their direct profits. Um, but the consequences of neglecting this crucial area impacts our community profoundly. So we, I, firmly believe in the potential of this plan and are eager to forge additional partnerships to cultivate mm -hmm. a, sustaining, a sustainable funding model one that integrates earned revenue with investment from university, state, and philanthropic sources, ensuring the vitality of our efforts to help move the needle in Nevada's mental health standing once and for all. And one last thing I'd like to say. Our lowly pirates with that tiny little payroll are six in one. Did I say that? I'm gonna say it again. <laughs> Today is their home opener. I think this practice team is sort of like the pirates, in that they are gonna overachieve and with the resources they have, because they're gonna work so well together. And I think if you follow this team, this Las Vegas uh, integrated mental and behavioral health team, and all of you that are part of the team, I think, so Michelle's now gonna take us through the next steps. Right, well I wanna underscore, and people in this room who've heard me talk before um, have heard me say this, but it is worth repeating over and over again. One of the advantages that we have at UNLV is we really do have a group of people who want to do this work together. We are friends already, right? We are not interested in egos. They're the people in this room that I can point to and look at, I know are on board. and. Um, it's not gonna, change isn't easy and sorting out how to you know, navigate and maybe build this plane as we fly it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do wanna acknowledge that. Um, but I know that the people that I've had the opportunity to get to know over the last 10 years, we have been working together a little bit and we're ready to take it to the next level. And uh, you can't say that about other institutions. I've put, I have presented this plan in other spaces and I've been looked at with skepticism and cynicism and what, masters and doctoral people training together? I mean, literally, and I think, wow, that's unfortunate. So yeah. we're not gonna play that game that way. 
So next steps uh, will be a meeting, um, a, another kickoff meeting with the president and the provost and the deans. And then I'm going to get ready, people. I'm emailing and I'm calling and we're going to have meetings and we're going to pri pri I've got tasks <laughs> and we're going to prioritize and start figuring out who's going to do what in what order and when spring training that's we're right practice you're going to so be out there your on the gloves. you're going to be out that's right show up stretch before hydrate yeah yeah, yeah. and we're just going to keep plugging away yeah, thank yeah. you so much, thank Michelle. You. And, and we're going to be part of the panel. And if you have questions, come find us afterwards. We'll want to keep this going so the other presenters have time. But thank you so much, and thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I have a second. I have a job. You do. I have a job. The technology is always a limiting factor. My next job is to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Sarah Hunt. Dr. Hunt came to UNLV in 2014 uh, under the Lindsay Institute and an initiative there to work on workforce development through a mental and behavioral health training coalition. We came together to talk about what we needed and, and what were the obstacles to getting our students trained. And we've come a long way, baby, I think. Uh, and Dr. Hunt had an idea. And um, she's, that idea has come to fruition. And she's here to present that to you today. And I turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Michelle. I know. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a hugging moment. So I realize, like, when you get us together, it's the long and the short of the story. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. I see so many familiar faces um, in the audience today. And some of you have been along this journey with me from start to finish, or you've popped in, um, you've heard a little bit about all of this along the way, but I'm really happy today to present kind of the whole story. Um, <clears throat> and just as a little caveat, I'm sorry for the sound of my voice. I've been fighting with a cold all week. Um, today I feel I'm winning, but just in case, I'm gonna open a bottle of water because it could go south real quick. So, all right. So I am so excited to talk today about Be Here Nevada um, and what Be Here Nevada is and how we came to this point. So Be Here Nevada is an acronym for the Behavioral Health Education Retention and Expansion Network of Nevada, which is a mouthful and hard to remember, but it shortens really cute to Be Here Nevada. And that's the point. We want people to be here and working in mental and behavioral health. And I cannot take credit for that. Um, that is all due to our marketing team at the School of Medicine. So they're the geniuses behind that. <clears throat> My objective today is just to tell you a story about the importance of partnership and policy to create an innovative behavioral health workforce initiative. I'm gonna walk us through a little bit of the history of Be Here Nevada, um, focus on who we partnered with, how and what the policy was, and then how we're implementing Be Here Nevada. So a little bit of the history. So um, Dave already talked a little bit about some of the workforce shortages and where we're at with that. But this is just another representation kind of um, drilling down to county level. So my colleague, uh, Dr. John Packham, he's up at the UNR Office of Statewide Initiatives. And for many years, this has been his job, is to count the number of healthcare professionals across the state of Nevada and break that down by county. And so working with him, we've really focused on um, you know, the mental health providers by county. So at the top, it says you know, the average um, US statistic is one mental health provider. Um, for 380 residents per population, 100,000 population. Nevada is kind of averaged out at one mental health provider for 422 residents, but that range really is quite um, extreme based on the county that you're looking at. So the darker shaded um, columns are where our kind of urban centers are. So Carson City, um, Clark County, and Washoe County, where Reno is down at the end there. Um, sorry, this slide got a little bit wobbly there. Story County should be 526. But you'll see in the rurals, then frontier areas, that range of um, one 
mental health provider for 258,000, 2,580 people in Lincoln County is quite extreme. So we're all over the map there when it comes to um, the mental health workforce per uh, population. Um, this was already highlighted. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this information came out a year ago in the Interim Health and um, Human Services uh, Committee. Sorry, in 2022 it came out. Um, I don't think this is probably any new news to anyone in the audience um, when it comes to talking about uh, the number of school mental health be, um, professionals we have per students. And just the need there, um, kind of getting at how many more we could possibly need to just meet national average. So again, all of those rates are just the US average. We aren't even talking about, hey, maybe we should be exceptional and go above um, the, the national average. So we've all known for many years that workforce, workforce, workforce is a need um, if we want to talk about better access to mental health care across our state, whether you're talking about what happens here in Las Vegas, Clark County, or in the rural frontier areas. So I started at UNLV um, in December of 2014, and I was hired at that time to work on a grant out of the Lindsay Institute about mental health workforce development in the state of Nevada. There was already a recognition um, at that time, so the Valencia Institute, um, through an interdisciplinary application, got some state funding to look at that. So we started with thinking about how could we possibly recruit more students into our mental health training programs, but more importantly, how do we get them to stay in Nevada after they graduate? So at that time in 2016, I was on a webinar and I heard about this um, model out of the state of Nebraska and it's called the Behavioral Health Education Center of Nebraska. And they were talking about how they use legislation to create a designated behavioral health workforce development center. I hadn't really heard about this concept before. So they talked about this piece of legislation in 2009 that was introduced by their Health and Human Services Committee. And essentially it said the legislature finds at this time that there are insufficient behavioral health professionals in the state of Nebraska, and so we need to do something about it, is essentially what the rest of the legislation said. Um, so I took a look at that, and what it said was we are going to invest in this idea of having um, a designated behavioral health workforce development center under the University of Nebraska in their medical center. And so um, what they did with Beacon is what they shortened it to, is they said, well, we're gonna give you state funding. So their first year, they got funded $1.3 million out of their state general fund. Um, if you kind of come up with this plan for how you're going to grow our own mental health professionals. So Beacon said, we are gonna look at this in kind of three chunks of this workforce development pipeline. So engage and recruit. They recognize, and I know a lot of you are mental health professionals in this audience, we just don't show up in the K through 12 system to talk about our careers, what it means to be a social worker, what it means to be a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and promote that. Not like our friends in nursing do, they do an amazing job at that, um, even pre-med. But mental health, we're just, I don't know, we just don't show up in those spaces. So we said, so in Nebraska, they said, we're gonna in, start an ambassador program. And what they've been doing is going out across their state and talking to high schoolers. They started with juniors and seniors and connected them with the idea of working in mental health and what that means, what education pathways you have to have, connected them to those education pathways within the state of Nebraska. And then they added a mentorship piece. So if you were a student in Nebraska and you were saying, yes, I really liked learning about being a social worker, I want to do that, then they would pair you with um, a mental health professional that was from your same geographic location. And that person would offer a little bit of mentorship while that student started their undergraduate um, courses just to be kind of a support system, someone to talk to them about you know, the career development to become a social worker. But what they thought was we're gonna invest in if we mentor them from their kind of home location, hopefully, when that student is done with their training, they'll feel that draw to come back to their home community and work and practice. And then they still have kind of that um, ongoing mentorship relationship. 
And if you think about the state of Nebraska, there are some similarities with Nevada. There are two kind of metro areas. There's Lincoln and Omaha, and then there's a lot of rural frontier area, very similar to us. And then they talked about the middle section of the pipeline, which is that higher education level. So if we could get students into um, our higher education programs, then what do we need to do to be able to offer additional training? Are there new programs that we need to start? What they recognize is they really struggled, um, or they had a, a shortage of psychiatry residency positions. So they used some of that funding to offer more residency spots in psychiatry, create new practicum placements um, for doctoral students in psychology and social work, um, and create intern positions. So <clears throat> I see some of my uh, fellow psychologists in the audience, and you know the importance of having um, pre-internship placements in your state um, so we don't lose students to other states when they have to fil fin finish that final year of training. And then the end section of that pipeline, the retention, so they looked at what do we need to do as a state to encourage and support the already existing workforce that we have so we're not losing what we already have in Nebraska. And they started off with offering um, free CEU trainings, continuing education trainings, um, and tried to pick topics that were really um, timely topics or uh, focus on you know, developing evidence-based treatments. So they really focused at that time in 2009 on telehealth. So that was something they were really trying to push out into the rural frontier areas to increase that access to care. So again, they started and did all of that with that funding per year. Um, the last figure I could find is they continue to get funding um, uh, in fiscal year 2020, uh, 2021 they were up to 1.6 million in um, state general funding. And they've, along the way, so over a decade now, been able to develop a really strong grant writing arm as well. So in addition to having that stability of state funding, they've increased their programming by bringing in state fun, um, uh, great grants from the federal government, mainly around workforce development. Then I'll notice, you'll note down here at the bottom, so ARPA funds, so that then the COVID happened, the pandemic happened, um, federal funds went out to each state, and in Nebraska, through legislative action, they awarded $25 million of their ARPA funds to the Beacon model and said, we want you to help us distribute this out in a way that will help improve behavioral health workforce development as well as meet the growing uh, mental health care needs because of this pandemic. So, they have been successfully doing that as well. So what do they have to show after a decade of existence? I think some pretty impressive things. So um, they do a legislative report every two years. They do this really nicely done report that they send back to their legislature and they put on their website that says, here's what we did in the past two years, here's how we spent the money. So through um, looking at a lot of their reports, um, in over a decade, they connected with more than 5,000 high school and college students in the state of Nebraska. Um, they strengthened partnerships with 18 different higher education institutions to collabor collaborate on training and workforce retention. They um, also were helpful in creating more integrated behavioral health clinics. Um, so some clinics that some, I think this was mainly through some FQHCs that were already providing primary care, they worked with them and partnered with them to really um, kind of bolster some behavioral health services and use that as um, training sites as well for their mental health students. And they also created their own job website. Um, so through uh, this link, Anybody in the state of Nebraska who has an opening for any type of mental health position can feed it into this one website. And as students are going through their higher education training programs in the state of Nebraska, they get like a membership to this job website. So they start getting fed um, you know, ads, job postings, as they're preparing to exit out of um, higher ed system. And this is what 
catches my eye every time. So in over 10 years of doing the work they've been doing, they can track a 44% increase in their state's behavioral health workforce. So that team is working well. Yeah, this is a good team. So I've, I've made a lot of good um, connections there with the folks in Beacon because I pester them all the time. What, so tell me how more about how you're doing this. How, how do we do that? Uh, and they've been very generous, generous with their time and information. So this has just caught my eye so much, and I just thought there's no reason why we can't do this here in Nevada. So how do we get here? Well, um, in Nevada, if it's not already trademark, um, this is the slogan. The third legislative session is the charm. <laughs> so thank you for laughing, Constance. <laughs> Um, I tried a couple different sessions to try and get someone to maybe make some, take some action on this, maybe think about it. There was some, uh, some good progress in some years, and then it kind of fizzled out. So I thought in preparation for the 2023 state session, I'm going to try a different strategy. In Nevada, we have five regional behavioral health policy boards. Each of those boards has one build draft request each session to use on something related to mental health that would help their regions. So in the summer of 2022, in the off season, another kind of baseball reference there, in the off season, <laughs> I decided to um, kind of see if I could um, present to each of those policy boards this idea from Nebraska and just see if anybody would be interested, if they'd be willing to have a conversation about it. Um, I went up to Winnemucca and met with the Rural Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board. And so their policy board covers those six rural counties. Um, that's just a little bit about their region. And I presented to them in May of 2022. Um, the board uh, initially said yes. I, we really like this idea. This makes a lot of sense to us. And so they um, heard a couple of their presentations. And in July of that, year, uh, that summer, they decided that, yes, they were going to use the Beacon model um, as their bill draft request. So then um, the, their board launched a subcommittee to kind of garner feedback from stakeholders statewide on the model. So they, at that time, I had presented them the, the copy of the Nebraska legislation so they could see what that looked like. I should also mention, um, in 2022, Illinois had started adopting the same model. So they had legislative language at that time. So I shared both states' um, examples with them. And through this meet, these meetings with stakeholders, they kind of came up with their um, idea of what um, a Nevada model would look like. So I worked collaboratively, collaboratively with the board chair, Fergus Lawfridge, and their coordinator, Valerie Haskin, and um, provided some consultation as they developed the language for their bill draft request. Uh, the full board approved the concept language for the bill, and they submitted it to the Legislative Council Bureau um, after their August 2022 meeting, which when the session started in the beginning of 2023, it was assigned to Assembly Bill Number 37. And essentially what this model said is we're going to build out a robust pipeline for behavioral health providers in, Nebra in <clears throat> Nevada. And again, they were referencing what had worked in Nebraska and Illinois. And what they really wanted to do was say, we're going to authorize the establishment of this Behavioral Health Workforce Development Center of Nevada, Nevada to start with outreach in the K through 12 system and focus all the way up to professional practice, practice that retention piece. So some of the same ideas and concepts, recruitment. So we're going to go out, uh, provide outreach and education about behavioral health professionals to the K through 12 system. The rural board also felt very strongly about doing the same outreach to adult learners. So those individuals who may be working in entry level positions in healthcare already or maybe looking for a career change, making sure that they understand the options to work in mental and behavioral health. Educate 
So what do we need to do under the Nevada system of higher education to either expand our training opportunities, develop new degree programs, clearer pathways? So making sure if a student says, yes, I want to start with the mental health technician uh, certification at College of Southern Nevada, that whatever they did, the courses that they took for that certification can easily transfer to another institution. And then the retention piece. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that the Rural Board also wanted to see happen here was a bit of a business technical assistance program. So thinking about those individuals who may be coming from out of state to start a new clinic or a new center or come in and set up a new practice, um, offering a kind of a one-stop place where they could get information about where do you get your business license, who are all the licensing boards that we have in our state, because we have a few licensing boards. Um, who are the insurance companies doing business in the state? So they wanted to write that into the bill as well. And how will this idea be rolled out? So <clears throat> the way that um, the rural board thought about this was kind of using a hub and spoke model. So having the main administrative hub of the center be at one of the institutions um, under the Nevada system of higher education. UNR or UNLV or a combination of both with regional hubs or exposure out to um, the state. And so what that has turned into, oh, before we get to that part, here's a little um, action shot of myself and Valerie Haskin from the Rural Board um, up at the legislative session. So with the um, help and partnership of our government affairs office at UNLV, um, we were able to have some meetings with legislators to really educate them about the concept of Assembly Bill 37, get their feedback on what, what they heard about the bill, um, question, answer any questions that they had. And um, these are actual screenshots of my computer as I was watching um, both houses take the vote on Assembly Bill 37. Um, so out of the Assembly and the Senate, it passed unanimously with full bipartisan support. So I couldn't believe my eyes, so I actually took a picture of the screen out of seeing. Just to, thank you. Uh, just wanted to make sure I had proof that in case somebody like, no, it didn't pass. I was going to say, no, I have a picture. That's what it said on my computer. Um, and it passed with funding. So we submitted a fiscal note under the Nevada system of higher education asking for $2 million for two years to get this started and going. Um, and then it was approved by Governor Lombardo on June 15th of 2023. So we've got work to do now. All right, so where do you begin with this? So first of all, because this is considered a Nevada system of higher education initiative, that's the way it's written in the language of the bill. And she had to designate who the um, administrative institution would be. So in the summer of 2023 out of UNLV, we submitted um, kind of a formal application to NSHE to say, hey, we'd like to be the administrative hub. And at their September 2023 Board of Regents meeting, they agreed with that. And so that was the official launch of Be Here Nevada. So what have we been doing um, since October 1 is kind of our official start date. Um, we've been very busy. Uh, so I myself cannot do the whole work of Be Here Nevada, so I have to hire people. Um, so I've been very focused on um, hiring and onboarding our personnel, and we have the three of them right here. Raise your hands and wave at everybody. So there's our, our Be Here staff back there. Um, we had to develop our outreach and marketing. We had to come up with a name. We had to come up with a color scheme green, which is, you know, represents mental health awareness and also is very entry neutral color because um, <laughs> we're statewide. Um, developing a website, which we have, but it's, you know, we're still tweaking it. So you can go and visit, but just keep coming back and visiting. And I did a lot of follow-up presentations. So a lot of people reached out and said, so you told us about this bill, what happened to it? So I was happy to come back and do those presentations. And now we've also been really focused on going out and meeting with all of the um, academic, uh, mental health academic training programs with, on, within the NSHE institution so we can introduce to them 
um, who we are and what we're doing. So how's it going? This is what we've been up to. So um, this picture over here on the left, um, that was the day we got our first retractable banner, which is <laughs> we were really super proud about. So that's myself, our graduate assistant, Eternity Claggett. Raise your hand. So Eternity is a, um, a couple and family therapy student here at UNLV. And we've been very excited to have her on board. And her voice as a student telling us about what it means to think about what program you want, um, where you might think about with a career afterwards has been very valuable. And then our administrative assistant extraordinaire, Adriana Monroy, um, raise your hand again. She's been super helpful with developing kind of our marketing concept and our social media presence. And then this is a picture of our very first career, high school career fair we attended um, last week at Fernley High School. So, and this is Jill Manet, who is one of our associate directors who's overseeing our K through 12 outreach. So Jill, raise your hand as well. Um, little known fact about Jill, she actually comes from the Wolf Pack up north. So she is based in Reno, um, but we wanted to hire individuals that also lived across the state as well because we're a statewide initiative. This is from our road trip out to Winnemucca where we went to visit over on the far end there, um, the Great Basin College up there, and again, make ourselves known to our higher education partners and programs about what Be Here is and how we can start um, partnering together to build that pipeline. So essentially, we were out checking the pipeline in northern Nevada last week. Um, Jill's been down here this week, and we've been checking the pipeline um, down here. And that's just a, a picture of one of our um, social media um, uh, posts that we did recognizing that April was Social Work Month and we connected folks to the different social work programs um, within the Nevada system of higher education. So what's next? A lot is next. Um, so we've got to do, we're going to work on continuing our outreach to the K through 12. So as we've been meeting with the different NSHE programs, we've been asking them, what connections do you already have to the local K through 12 system? And we're learning a lot about that. Um, so we're collaborating with NSHE mental and behavioral health programs, data, data, data. So we're partnering with, again, John Packham's office up at UNR, Office of Statewide Initiatives, to really um, start tracking the work, mental health workforce trends over time. Um, we've got a lot of good ideas about that. Um, we're exploring grant opportunities. We, we have one that I really want to be able to announce, but it's still being worked out. Um, but more to come on grant opportunities. Um, we've brought on a, a senior grant specialist, uh, Ruby Kelly, who will be helping us look for those uh, federal, especially federal opportunities to apply for behavioral health workforce development grants. Our first legislative report, so in our legislation, it asks us to write a report every year to the legislature to show them what we've been doing, how we've been spending the money. So that money, that report will go to the legislation, it will go to the Board of Regents, it will be on our website. Um, coming up in the next fiscal year, uh, we're gonna focus more on that retention part of the pipeline as well. So thinking about what do we need to do um, to best support the current existing workforce, but also how can we start reaching out to our students that are ready to graduate and connecting them to those employment opportunities in Nevada. Uh, that Business Technical Assistance Center, that's something that we're gonna work on developing in the next fiscal year, um, and continued funding. So the way that we plan to move forward is to continue to ask NG to um, include the Be Here budget as part of their budget ask in the next legislative session. So again, I think the stability of that state funding in Nebraska has contributed to that success. And we just ask that you follow us. So this is new to me. I'm not a big social media person, but um, follow us. If you scan that QR code, that will um, get you signed up for our newsletter. So we're working on putting out a monthly newsletter so you can kind of follow us along um, and keep track of what we're doing. 
Um, and this is our little mascot. So this is Winnie the elephant. Um, yes, very cute. Um, and we named her Winnie because our origin story started in Winnemucca when I went out to that Rural Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board meeting. So they will always have a special place in my heart. So that is Winnie. Um, and that's what I wanted, the story I wanted to share with you today of how Be Here um, got to be and where we plan to go with it. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share more about that with you. All right, and now I'm very happy to um, pass it off to our final presentation this morning to Dr. Chris Carney. All right, well, good morning. good morning. My name is Christopher Carney. I'm a professor in the psychology department here at UNLV. I'm actually in that group that Dr. Paul talked about who have been here at least 25 years. I won't tell you exactly how many years I've been here, but um, the more than 25, so I have seen the evolution of what a lot of uh, Dr. Paul talked about. I'm also grew up in upstate New York like Michelle, so we always joke that we had the exact same childhood, just 300 miles apart. Um, <laughs> but the downside of that is it makes me a diehard New York Yankees fan, so I apologize for that. Um, but I am also the director of the UNLV Child School Refusal and Anxiety Disorders Clinic, and I better do my slide. Um, and that is a mouthful, but it's an outpatient research therapy clinic that provides low-cost services to families of children and adolescents who have school attendance problems uh, and anxiety-related kinds of conditions. Um, and that's, under, that's associated with the practice umbrella of services. Uh, my collaborative partner this morning is Dr. Kellyanne Beavers. She's a research associate with the Lindsay Institute. Both Kellyanne and I are very grateful to the organizing committee uh, and to the Lindsay Institute for arranging today's event and for inviting us uh, to uh, present. And we're grateful to all of you for spending some of your valuable time with us this morning. Thank you. Uh, our contact and website information are presented here for additional detail regarding our background and expertise, so please feel free to reach out to us at any time in the future if you have any questions. Uh, the pilot project that we're going to be discussing today is actually funded through a UNLV UNR uh, Cooperative Extension Collaborative Grant, and this, will, this involves a school-based service delivery model uh, that is uh, designed for children's mental health based on a multi-tiered systems of support framework, which I'll be talking about in a little while. I'm actually a clinical child psychologist by training and background, and so what I wanted to do was just sort of start with a couple of graphics that show the current trends in children's mental health nationally. So this graphic illustrates the rise in the percentage of children with a mental health condition since 2012. Uh, and it's parsed out by race, ethnicity, and identified through electronic health records. So this refers to seven million children who were presented to medical health care systems and access to treatment. Uh, you can see that the general prevalence based on this is about 15 to 20 percent, but a lot of researchers estimate that the true overall rate of mental disorder among children and adolescents is probably closer to 40 percent. Um, a lot of the increase in mental health challenges among children and adolescents has been driven by increases in emotional disorders. So we heard a little bit earlier about the, the, the depressive aspect. It's really a lot of it is driven by anxiety and depression, which themselves have increased about 20 to 30 percent over the last few years, in addition to suicidality. Those seem to be the major drivers of these increases in mental health conditions among children and adolescents. Now, there's been a lot of speculation and research as to why this is the case, um, why these things have sharply increased in recent years. A lot of attention on social isolation that accelerated during the pandemic shutdown era. Uh, a lot of focus on increased social media use uh, among children and adolescents and on adverse child experiences that are represented in the graphic here by the dashed line. So you can see that the prevalence of 
adverse child experiences actually matches very closely with the rise in mental health conditions. So when you talk about adverse child experiences, uh, these include things like experiencing violence or maltreatment. It could be um, suicidal behavior in family members. It could be witnessing violence in one's home or community, food and housing insecurity, racial discrimination, other traumatic kinds of experiences. So you can see that the rates for both of those kinds of things kind of rise in parallel. Another possible explanation for increases in mental health disorders among children and adolescents is missing school. Um, and that's, we know that school often serves as a source of academic support, but for many kids it also serves as a source of non-academic support. So uh, things like mentoring and coaching, things like uh, food, um, medical and disability care, career advising, socialization, all of those are strong non-academic kinds of supports. So this graphic illustrates the rates of chronic absenteeism in Nevada public schools over the past few years, which you can see largely parallels the patterns that are seen for mental health conditions in children and adolescents, and which also mirrors national trends. So when we talk about chronic absenteeism, that's defined by the federal government as missing 10% or more of days from school. So this graphic only includes those kids with severe school absenteeism. So if you've got a child that's missing, say, 7% or 9% of days of school, they're not in this graphic. So you can tell that there's a lot of kids that are lacking access to those academic and non-academic supports. So unfortunately, the combined treatment rate for any child or adolescent mental disorder is only about 38%. So only about a third of kids who need treatment, who get, who enter community-based care are actually, well, they're actually entering community-based care for treatment for a mental health disorder. Um, and that rate is actually worse for certain groups. Um, that's the overall rate, but it's particularly suppressed for underserved groups. So uh, kids who are part of racial or ethnic minorities, uh, rural students, um, kids that are in uh, low-income households, non-binary gender youth, LGBTQ and sexual minority youth, and also kids who have subclinical conditions. So those are kids that have symptoms of a mental health disorder, but it doesn't necessarily rise to a clinical diagnosis. They're particularly underserved in our community. In addition, of course, to children who live in low to middle income countries. It's also particularly worse in geographical areas that have significant fragmentation, and Dr. Paul talked about the use of that word earlier, in different areas of care or systems of care for children. So you have a lot of scattered mental health care across different kinds of agencies. And that could involve medical and hospital settings, various mental health agencies. It could be for kids, uh, the developmental system of care, legal, residential, child protective services, and other agencies. Parents have to navigate this huge patchwork or uncoordinated hodgepodge of system to try to find the care that is needed for their particular child. It's also particularly worse, and we heard this earlier, for youth in Nevada, which ranks last among the US states in overall youth mental health rankings. Just to put an exclamation point on that, I worked for a year in the Mississippi healthcare system. So the fact that Nevada is ranked below that state is not good. <laughs> so why is this the case? So I know that this slide is, is kind of busy in its content, but I did that deliberately uh, because what I wanted to do was make the illustrative point that there are many barriers to community-based care for families of children with a mental health condition. But these barriers generally fall into three main categories. So one category are system level factors. So that's things like financial cost, the limited availability of providers, and the lack of affordable services. Just to give you a kind of a, a personal example, you know, I mentioned my clinic deals specifically with school attendance problems and anxiety-related disorders. For many years, when parents called me, that was specifically what they were calling me for. What's happened in the last few years is that parents are calling me with all kinds of conditions that have nothing to do with what our clinic is set up for. They're calling about autism, ADHD, substance use, even chronic <coughs> medical conditions. And why are they doing that? They're doing that because they are desperate for any kind of affordable service, any kind of foot in the door to see a therapist of any kind, right? No matter what it is, no matter what's available. This can also involve practice level factors, so things like cultural and language differences, uh, limited specialized care options, and very long protracted wait times to get in to see a therapist. 
Uh, but it includes personal factors as well. There's a lot of stigma around mental health care. Uh, there's a lot of mistrust of providers. And there's limited what we call mental health literacy. So mental health literacy refers to the knowledge and beliefs that people have about mental disorders and when they should seek treatment, which can be very confusing for parents and families. So I want to break that part down a little bit. Let's talk about the latter. Let's walk through some of the contorted steps that a family has to take to access community-based care, even if they have the social and financial capital to be able to do so. So let's take a typical case. This is one that I know a lot of us see. I see it a lot. Uh, let's assume you've got parents of a child uh, who's got a lot of symptoms of anxiety and depression, and they're having difficulty going to school, or they're actually missing school. It's a common clinical presentation, especially in the last few years. So in this situation, parents have to decide first whether those child experiences are true symptoms of a mental disorder or whether it's something more momentary or transient. Is it a phase that the child is going through, right? One of the top statements that I get when parents call me about my clinic is, I don't know whether I should be calling you or not. Because they don't really know whether this is a true serious condition or whether it's something that if they're doing wrong or something was different that would sort of ameliorate itself on its own. That's not an uncommon kind of issue. So let's assume that even if something more serious is decided upon, then the parents have to decide whether or not they should take action. And even if they decide on that, then they have to figure out what options there are for intervention. So should we see a therapist? Well, OK, there's a lot of different types of therapists out there. Um, should we go see our pediatrician? Should we? talk to the pastor at our church, right? Should we link the child up with some kind of coach or mentor or something like that? Even if they decide on a therapist, uh, then actually finding one and actually starting treatment are significant challenges. And then remaining in treatment is a challenge. The most common number of treatment sessions that people have if they end up in treatment is one. The median is five, but most clinical researchers would tell you that you need at least 10 to 20 sessions to really work through a formal mental health condition. And even at that point, if there's a problem with ineffective treatment, or there's a recurrence of symptoms like depression, or there's a relapse back to original levels of functioning, then the process has to start all over again. So a lot of children with mental health challenges are not, by and large, in community-based care. So where the heck are they, right? Where have all the children actually gone? So a lot of mental health uh, professionals who specialize with children and adolescents, we're not giving up on community-based care, but we're also gravitating toward a where-they-are approach that moves mental health care to more accessible kinds of settings or where children actually are. So that could be primary care centers, maybe a pediatrician or a physician's assistant. It could be at a church or another faith setting, um, talking to a clergy person, or maybe enrolling an adolescent in a teen group. It could be a recreational center or an outdoor venue where the parents are seeking the help of a coach or a mentor or maybe an available support group. Or it could be somebody at school. Right? It could be a school psychologist or a school-based social worker, although we heard earlier that sometimes they're hard to, dip, uh, to, to access. But it could be a teacher or the school nurse. For us, in our clinic, most of the referrals that we get are from school counselors. School counselors are really at the nexus of a lot of different areas of functioning for children and adolescents. In the United States, schools are actually the de facto mental health system for children and adolescents. So up to 80% of kids who receive mental health care, 80%, up to 80%, do so to some extent in a school setting. Schools are the most common location for mental health service utilization in this country. And that's actually more so for kids with greater symptoms or clinical diagnoses. So actually, the more severe your condition, the more likely it is that you're only going to be seeing someone in a school setting. So that process of sort of moving healthcare and moving mental health care more and more into the schools, especially over the last 20 to 30 years, has really been driven a lot by legislative directions that emphasize school-based mental and behavioral health services, that emphasize mental health awareness training, uh, that emphasize 
crisis intervention and safety procedures, as well as school-based reimbursement for other kinds of services. So let me just give you some examples. I know this is a little dry, but uh, I did want to point it out. Uh, the 21st Century Cures Act provides mental health awareness training for school staff and teachers to recognize and intervene with mental health crises that students may be experiencing. In addition, for at least 20% of the funding through the Every Student Succeeds Act, at least 20% of that funding has to be allocated to programs that are related to safe and healthy students, and that can include school-based behavioral <coughs> health services. And a change in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services free care policy allows schools to use Medicaid funding for health programs that are provided free of charge to students, and that can include counseling. So the point of all that is that there's been significant policy shifts over the last 20 years to move health and mental health care for children and adolescents into school settings. In addition, using schools in this regard has a key advantage in that schools are often considered to be a soft entry point for care. So schools are a central access point for many different um, resources through their partnerships that they have with a lot of community-based uh, support agencies. And families tend to see schools as much less stigmatizing, right? It's, it's a local institution in their neighborhood. It also reduces the financial and the transportation challenges that many families face. The other point that I want to make about schools is that, and this is especially true in the post-pandemic era, Schools are much more amenable now to ways in which mental health care will likely be delivered in the future. So schools are, when they went through the pandemic, they really had to ramp up technologically. They're much better suited now to those methods of service delivery that you're going to see more and more of over the next 20 years. And that's things like computer-assisted programs, mobile text messaging, uh, portals, smartphone applications, uh, telehealth and video conferencing, uh, virtual reality and wearable devices, among other kinds of things. Schools are much better set up for that than they used to be. So one key model of school-based service delivery involves what's known as a multi-tiered systems of support, or MTSS, approach. Uh, this is actually a framework. It's not an intervention per se, but it's a framework that arranges interventions or treatments or support services according to the level of student need. A key advantage of this approach is that it includes tier one or preventative practices, and those are designed to enhance student functioning and catch problems early in the process. So the idea is to move away from a wait to fail approach to move away from a system where we wait until a problem develops into a full-blown disorder or wait until the problem has been going on for a long period of time. Tier two practices focus on early intervention for emerging or acute problems. So again, trying to catch these problems, nipping them in the bud before they develop into more severe issues. And tier three practices, which can include community-based care, uh, focus on more intensive interventions for chronic and severe problems. So MTSS approaches have been designed for a variety of student issues. They've been designed for behavioral issues, for academic issues, social issues, um, different kinds of health issues. Our group has designed an approach specifically for school attendance problems. So the MTSS approach that Dr. Beavers and I will be piloting is one actually designed for a preschool and a kindergarten first grade setting. And what we're going to be doing is monitoring early school attendance problems and screening for mental health and behavioral problems in four to six-year-old children. And this will be occurring at the Hills Preschool and Battle Born Academy here in Las Vegas. MTSS approaches are actually available in, Nev in Nevada and nationally, but almost always occur at middle and high school levels. And I'll talk a little bit later why we're focusing on some of the earlier grades. So we chose to monitor school attendance problems, and what we're going to be looking at is missing at least 25% of school time in a one-week period. Because school absences are a ready-made benchmark that schools already have at their disposal that can serve as an early warning signal for problems in multiple domains of student functioning. So we know, for example, that missing school is very proximal to certain kind of mental disorders, especially emotional, disruptive, and traumatic disorders. There are others as well. We know that student absences are closely related to problems in physical health. In fact, epidemiologists often use wide-scale school attendance and absenteeism data as a surveillance system for infectious diseases. 
Um, we know that it's closely linked to problems in academic achievement and school engagement, and problems in social competence and emotional self-regulation. It's also linked to problems in family functioning. When families are going through stressful family transitions, you tend to see a lot of absenteeism. It's also a good marker of school climate. If you've got an oppressive, violent, or negative school climate, you also tend to see very high levels of absenteeism in that school. And of course, it's been used as well to sort of look at more broader, um, unhealthy macroeconomic states and communities. The purpose of this slide is basically to tell you that school attendance problems really serve as a marker of problems across various ecological levels. But again, it's an easily accessible benchmark that schools can use as sort of an early warning system. So what we're gonna be doing is assisting school-based personnel with the tier one practices of monitoring school attendance problems in real time. Many schools don't really look at their attendance data very often. They may look, they may look at it after several months or they might send a letter home after a child's been missing school for 20 days or so. What we're gonna be doing is helping the school officials actually monitor the attendance in real time on a weekly basis. And then we're, if, if a child is missing at least 25% of time uh, during that one week period, screening for the presence of any kind of mental or behavioral health challenge or what we call functional impairment. And at tier two, if a student is missing that kind of school time and does show signs of impairment, they do so, show signs of a mental health or a behavioral issue, then we'll be working with the in-house personnel to develop early intervention plans to minimize school absences and to improve mental health and behavioral functioning. So for example, how can we turn a situation where maybe the child was going to miss six days of school, how can we turn that into two days of school? How can we turn a, a more full-blown mental or behavioral health challenge into something that's more manageable? And that could be through parent training, different kind of classroom management strategies, and other kinds of things that the school officials will be implementing with our help. Uh, at tier three, if you have a student that's missing a considerable amount of school, and or they have significant behavioral or mental health challenges, then we'll be working with school personnel to link the families to appropriate and available community-based care options as available. We also plan to enhance the long-term sustainability of this implementation. Always a big challenge in these implementation kind of things is keeping it sustained over time. So we wanna put systems in place that allow the school officials to more efficiently screen and intervene early with emerging student problems in the future. So an important supportive aspect of that is, you know, a big part of MTSS approaches is moving from tier two to tier three kinds of services. Um, so another big part of our pilot project is the development of a community asset map of mental health resources in Clark County. So as I mentioned, finding mental health care uh, is quite a daunting task not just for families, but also school officials, school counselors who are trying to navigate all these different systems of care. So what we're currently doing is collecting information on all the mental health providers in Clark County, and that's going to include key information along the parameters that you see here. So of course, basic contact information, name, picture, company, address, phone, email, but in addition, uh, any kind of website or directory links that the provider has, their office and business hours, and any other available contact information. We'll also be looking at the provider's credentials, what are their areas of specialization, um, do they have a multilingual status, uh, what different age groups do they address, uh, what are their treatment approaches. Waitlist length, of course, is very important. You know, how long does it actually take to get in to see the therapist? And we're gonna to try to keep this updated in real time so that um, parents and school officials have that information at their fingertips. We'll also be looking at different session parameters. So what is the provider's change or cancellation or contact policy? Um, what is the length of sessions? And what is the session format? So are the sessions offered individual, couple, family, group? Is it offered only in person? Is there a telehealth option? Is there a hybrid option? We want to make sure that all that is pretty transparent. And of course, payment cost options are important as well. How much does it actually cost? Uh, does the provider offer a sliding scale for low-income households? Um, do they accept insurance? And if so, what kinds? If they don't accept insurance, why don't they? We want to make sure that that's put on there as well. And then do they accept Medicare or Medicaid? And then there's other more specialized, more nuanced kinds of things that we're gonna include. So for example, many providers are at different locations on different days with different days and times, but we wanna make sure that that's uh, easily available as well. 
So that information is designed primarily for school counselors and other in-house school personnel who can use this information to more quickly link families to needed mental health support. So we're about 80% done with the data collection process on that. We expect to be done by June 1st, and then we're gonna move it onto a, a website format. Eventually what we wanna do is leverage our partnerships with other agencies to link this list of resources with parent-based resources. So for example, um, if you look at the Go to Grow Coalition and uh, nvfamily.org, they have a variety of parent-based resources for school absenteeism. They wanna partner with us to kind of link their uh, asset map with ours. And of course, eventually we wanna include more non-mental health resources as well. So some of the key outcomes that we're gonna be looking at are school attendance, uh, mental and health behavioral challenges, but we also wanna look at the type of services that families eventually pursue. So do they stick with a school-based intervention? Do they pursue outpatient or inpatient therapy? Do they uh, go to an emergency department? Do they engage in telehealth? We wanna kinda keep track of those kinds of things. So why are we focusing specifically on preschool and kindergarten first grade? So as I mentioned, a lot of MTSS models um, tend to focus more on middle and high school and very few focus on the early developmental periods. Um, but if you look at this graphic, this shows the trajectories of major mental health conditions in children and adolescents. And you can see that greater severity is usually already evident in late elementary, middle, and high school. So we're gonna be focusing our efforts primarily in the red circle. Uh, the research is pretty clear that early school absenteeism and early symptoms of mental and behavioral disorder, especially in late preschool and early elementary school, are strongly predictive of later school achievement and school attendance problems as well as mental health disorders. So catching these problems early in the developmental period, we're hoping will mitigate some of these later, more severe kinds of conditions. And then I wanted to give a little bit more detail about our project by talking about how it matches up well with UNLV's top tier 2.0 vision in several ways. Um, the project has and will continue to involve undergraduate and graduate students who are utilizing the project data for their own achievement. Um, one of my graduate students, for example, is conducting dissertation work on the community asset map and we'll be using the information from that map in addition to uh, zip code, census, and school absenteeism data to identify areas of need, in particular mental health provider deserts in Clark County. And of course, we can sort of extend the idea of student achievement to the children who will be part of the pilot project and I'm hoping will be UNLV students in the year 2037. So gotta watch out for that demographic cliff. <laughs> Uh, the project is also aligned with the UNLV academic health strategic objectives and probably the most important one is providing high value, high quality, state-of-the-art care for all members of our community. Um, Dr. Beavers and I also think the project can be a key aspect of socioeconomic development because it focuses on augmenting the long-range student completion outcomes for kids, but it can also be a focus of a lot of policy initiatives. So for example, we know across Nevada that there's a severe shortage of rental homes that are available and affordable to low-income households, which means greater evictions. We also know that a, a, a strong predictor of chronic absenteeism is residential mobility, where families have to move during the course of the academic year, and that increases the chance of delays in new bus and school assignments, which means missing more school. So there's a lot of intersection among these issues. We also feel that the project is amenable to a wide range of community partnerships, many of which uh, Kellyanne and I have already leveraged because of their considerable interest in student absenteeism and children's mental health. And we feel the project is part of a social justice, equity, and inclusion framework because MTSS approaches are designed to address all children in a given school. Um, and it's designed to provide intensive services to particularly at-risk students and especially students with disabilities. It's also designed to rely on data-driven processes to drive continuous improvements in many different kinds of student outcomes. So I play many roles here at UNLV, and another one of my roles at UNLV is chair of the psychology department. So I did wanna mention some of our clinical faculty that also engage in several mental health initiatives. Uh, Dr. Paul mentioned Dr. Allen, who is uh, pretty 
uh, involved at the practice with his ESMI work. But I also want to mention uh, Dr. Stephen Benning, who's in the audience today. He focuses on no-cost psychological symptom assessments. Uh, Dr. Kara Christensen Pacella, who focuses on interventions for disordered eating using uh, novel methods of treatment delivery, such as mobile-based interventions. Uh, Dr. Shane Krauss, who focuses on addictive behaviors, problem gambling, and barriers to help seeking among high-risk groups. Uh, Dr. Brenna Wren, who's also in the audience today, focuses on behavioral interventions for older adults, especially through integrated primary care and digital platforms. And Dr. Nicole Short, who focuses on digital health interventions delivered in the early aftermath of trauma. You'll see that a common thread here is um, new service delivery methods uh, along the lines of those that I mentioned earlier. Our clinical faculty really are on the cutting edge of mental health service delivery methods. So again, Dr. Beavers and I want to thank you for um, coming here today. We really appreciate your, your attendance, and we're happy to speak with you further as needed. Thank you. So as we uh, transition to the final portion of the program today, our panel, I just wanted to uh, take a moment to give some thank yous, obviously, to the wonderful team at UNLV TV. I think we counted, we're about 150 recordings they've done for us um, on the Lindsay side and the Brookings Mountain West side. Obviously, I want to thank our donors who have been, uh, support us, give us the autonomy to conduct these research and put on these types of community forums. And of course, um, on our team, Caitlin Saladino and Ashley uh, LeClaire have been just absolutely wonderful in doing all the work behind the scenes. It's just stuff just doesn't happen on its own. Um, so I want to thank them as well. So I'll invite our panelists up and we'll uh, do that. Oh, you found Okay. Am I on the panel? You were on the panel, Paul. Okay. I sent you the question. <laughs> so we have uh, three panelists who are joining us today. Each are going to were chosen for a unique perspective. We have Paul um, going to give us the, the national perspective. Sarah, obviously, her work um, on, on uh, at the state level, and of course the regional level in the in Nevada, and at the local level, and as well as from the perspective of the uh, elected official, we have with us today uh, Mayor Pro Tem and City of Las Vegas Councilman Brian Knudsen. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I have uh, long admired the councilman here for his strong advocacy um, for improving governance and policy including his work on the Southern Nevada Regional Planning Coalition to create a venue for regional policy development and prioritization, his work on the academic uh, medical district in downtown Las Vegas, and his advocacy, um, of course, for children's mental health. So thank you for joining us today. Um, so what we're hoping for today is to have a conversation, um, including some audience participation. And to that end, we are uh, invoking the phone a friend rule here <laughs> um, on this one. Um, so some of the questions uh, may, uh, others' expertise in the audience may, may be useful. So we will uh, be reaching out so, um, for that as well. So you know, as we work through the, the presentations today, um, one of the common themes, obviously, was the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on, on mental health. And I guess we'll just start with a basic question here. Would we even be here today without COVID-19? I want to just start by saying that um, 40 years ago, in 1984, I did my first study. And in 500 communities, we've done community health assessments, whatever they are. And I remember back in the early 90s when every community rushed to do these community health assessments. And mental health wasn't really part of those assessments until probably the early 2000s when someone said, could you do a mental health assessment? So our company started getting involved with mental health assessments and we realized that why are we doing them? And over here the hospitals wanted us to do um, the um, community health needs assessments, because they said mental health isn't part of community health needs assessment. Um, and only very recently, and only really since COVID, which is sad, I'm going back 40 years, and I'm telling you, Dave, <laughs> that just in the last couple years, we've had an integrated approach to looking at community health and not bifurcating it 
we're trifurcating it and trying to make it into little boxes. So I feel that COVID did do that. It now makes it clear to everybody that you can't have a conversation about health without a conversation about mental health or behavioral health. But the sad thing, and this is a sad part of what I want to share with everybody is, uh, I've spent my whole life studying and being involved in 500 communities. And how much time did we waste? We just wasted a lifetime to get to this conversation. And Sarah, you had mentioned, you know, the third time they charged in the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> um, we think of this in terms of a like policy window, right? You've been working on this idea for many, many years, and you know things come together in the 2023 session. How much did the awareness of mental health from COVID-19 mm -hmm. sort of pave the way for, for the legislature? I think that was a big theme in the 2023 session. Um, in the 2021 session, <clears throat> if you think about how the legislature actually had to meet during that time because of COVID, um, what I heard, which was a little different in the 2023 session, is I was hearing the legislators talk more openly about mental health concerns, either their own lived experiences, or they were talking about the experience of trying to find care for loved ones, or they were certainly hearing it from their constituents that this is a problem. So that was something that was a little different to me, um, that it was very much an open conversation about that. <clears throat> Councilman, have you seen COVID more acceptance of this among uh, your, your colleagues and among staff and just hearing much more about it? At the local level, I don't, I don't think COVID would have brought about, <coughs> excuse me, would have brought about um, conversations around mental health. Um, I would like to think as a state, as a community, we would have been here. I don't know that that's the case. Uh, COVID just exacerbated things. Um, but before COVID, we didn't have a system in place either. So I hope post COVID, we're able to move a little bit faster to the, to the point that uh, Dr. Hunt made, timing is everything and never waste a good opportunity or a good crisis because there definitely has been a crisis and it's, it's really prime time to jump in and present plans. Can, I'll just add too, I think COVID, but certainly many in the um, audience are familiar with the 2022 Department of Justice report that came out mm -hmm. that um, Nevada was called out for their overuse of kind of over um, use of institutionalizing children for mental and behavioral health care because we didn't have enough community based services. So that also put a very bright light on especially children's mental health care. <clears throat> So we saw from the data presentations um, that Nevada historically ranks very, very low in mental health metrics, high to ban, limited support here. So Paul, what are the best practices across the U.S. as you've been in all these communities? Who's doing it well? Well, I think that one thing that is always amazing to me is that there are certain states that seem to be able to do things well, uh, and they're not that different in their dem demographics. They're just different. In their, in their people. And, and um, Sarah had mentioned Nebraska. And it, it's funny, if you go to data maps, like heat maps, go and look at workforce shortages. And the state of Nebraska is in a white color, which means that all their counties have all the people they need. And all the states around them are in dark red, like Kansas doesn't do well. Nebraska does great. Uh, the states all around don't do well, but Nebraska looks great. Why can you pull Nebraska out? And then you look at other states like Mississippi, you had mentioned, uh, and West Virginia, which is suburban Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's the largest city in West Virginia. <laughs> and, and, they do and it comes down, in my experience as a planner, uh, to this thing called social capital, which is defined as the currency of getting along. And did you see that hug that was done up here on stage between Sarah and Michelle? They created in that moment currency. So do certain places do it better? Yes, but I'm believing, as I've studied this for a long time, that it's really the currency of people knowing and getting along together. And the other thing I've learned, one last thing, is that there's a mix between old timers and newcomers. And if you have only newcomers, no one can get nothing done. But if you only have old timers, they sit around and say it can't be done. 
So in a place like Nevada, you have a harder time because you have the ratio of new time comers and old timers. So the old timers have to work harder to get the right mix with all the newcomers, and that's hard. So I think social capital and the currency of getting along is probably more the difference than that one state is better or worse. It's the humans and how they work together. I really believe that firmly. Yeah. Sarah, obviously you pulled heavily fr from Nebraska and you're still in contact with them, so they're sort of mentoring you through this process. Yes. Yeah, um, it, I, I agree with that so social um, currency, is that what you called it? Yeah. The currency of getting along. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that was really key in getting this concept um, over this final hurdle in this last legislative session. And I think about that partnership again with going to the Rural Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board. Um, <clears throat> and there were a couple of legislators that commented, you know, so you, you two are together? <laughs> um, and wanted clarification. Well, you're saying this is a rural bill, but why is UNLV here talking to me? And so clarifying that, yeah, we're, we're partnering together. We're working on this together because this whole state needs to work together on this workforce shortage issue. Um, <clears throat> so I think there are other states out there that are trying different things along the, those different parts of the pipeline to address um, workforce shortages. And we're always kind of keeping an eye out for that. So what is being implemented in other states? What seems to be working well for them? and. Does that make sense for us to do here, or do we need to Nevadaize it a little bit? So, yeah, there, every we're not the only state struggling with this. And I would just <coughs> double, I would double down on that. Uh, the social capital is the most important part. Uh, and I'm not a mental health care professional. I have no training in it. Um, I'm a dad, and I have incredible access. So that, that's how I look at it. And um, my own children were struggling, and I, I had to figure out how to gain access to a system that doesn't exist. Um, struggled with it, reached out to as many people as I could, and realized that there is there is no system. So I'm going to have to make it up myself for my children. So if I'm going to choose as an elected official to jump into something, I have to make sure there's enough social capital, uh, social currency there, uh, that it's worth going forward. Because if everyone's in fighting, it just, it's going to die immediately. Um, so we put together a couple of different times. So for me to test the waters to see, can all these mental health professionals get along? Um, because if you can't get along, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and that's what I found and am very happy to see that everyone gets along, they just need access. And so that's, the, that's the, what I, where I think there's going to be enormous opportunity in the next couple of years in particular. Do you have opportunities to talk to elected officials in other jurisdictions and how they're dealing with these problems? All the time. It's a, it's a major issue. It doesn't present as mental health to local elected officials or state elected officials, and that's because background and expert, expertise or knowledge base isn't around mental health. I don't know that there's any elected officials that, that I can think of that have a background in mental health. So the ideas, the thoughts, the imaginations that come to them are going to present themselves in a variety of different ways. You have to figure out how to translate it back to mental health. So homelessness, for example, drug abuse and addiction, the issues that we're facing in the jail system, in the EMS system, um, in the school system, those are presenting as emergency medical issues, those are presenting as criminal issues, they're presenting as education issues. You really have to help them understand as outside professionals what, what mental health looks like and how they can get to the root of the problem. It seems like that's a great um, plug for those professionals in the audience. I'm looking at a lot of them to run for office then. <laughs> I, I would Seriously. <laughs> I, but I think we have to. I think there have to be more of those voices that are making policy that have that lived, that experience. So I seriously put a plug in for run for Still office. Pack going, right? Right. It yeah. makes a huge difference to have experience and education when you're when you're talking about a thousand different issues. And um, I'm just fortunate I have two amazing children that had to access a system that didn't exist. And so now I'm put in a position where I can advocate and use a position for something that is worthwhile. Yeah, so many uh, uh, elected officials have profound mental health issues, uh, but it'd be great to have mental health professionals in, in the chair. <laughs> Um, it'd be great, and, and all kinds of diagnoses of every of every form, and I'm not just talking nationally. Um, I, I want to just say something too about 
the, the role of people uh, and professionals is that if we stay too much in our lane and we don't swim out of our lanes, uh, we can't create the change that we really need. So um, that's really difficult from the way we're trained. I'm a geographer. Uh, one of my dear friends, Rob Lang, who I sat in this room with many, many times, he called himself an urban geographer. And he encouraged me to call myself that. I now have other things that I've done academically and some things I've done uh, professionally. But, but if I only think of the world through economic geography, um, and only want to talk about economic impact studies everywhere, I'm not going to make much of a change. So it's a personal thing we have to do and say, yeah, what am I the best? I have a pretty good shortstop in economic geography. You know, I'm not in the Hall of Fame or now in the afterlife, Rob, but, but it was okay. But, but what about other gifts that we have? How do we play with each other and how do I bring economic geography into this conversation? And I think what we're all in this room trying to do is to say, where can we swim and meet others? Because we're just so focused on the, on the role that we play and the title that we have. And I, I, I think that's where we get into trouble. As people, I think it comes down to us as people. Well, that's something I learned from Rob, is getting out of your comfort zone. Yeah. You can keep doing the same thing over and over, but you're never going to challenge yourself. You never I want to go back to something you said, um, and you, you hit on a key point there, is it almost seems overwhelming, all the different potential constituencies we're talking here. We obviously heard about youth. Um, we have the unhoused. We have veterans. We have those struggling with substance abuse. We have maternal. Right, it almost seems overwhelming to try to serve all of these different constituencies um, that that are in need here. So, how do we? What's the best approach here? Um, is it state? Is it regional? Is it local? Is it funding from the state and funding for the federal government and let local uh, entities do it? I mean, how how's the best way to to address the these different constituencies? I start. I start with follow follow the energy. Um, so. It's, it's really easy to map out a, a thousand different plans, and I love plans, and I love spiral-bound plans. Um, but the, the, the first thing to do is take action and see if there's energy around it. If there's one step forward and people are happy and excited, then you can take the next step. And if they're happy and excited there, take the next step and keep going. And so it, I get the question a lot is, where should we put all of our energy and resources? It's whatever's the thing that everyone agrees to. Let's go there first, and then everything else becomes easier. Because once you have a success, it's amazing how much easier it is for people to get along after that. Mm -hmm. So, like for me, I, I talk about children's mental health. Um, if the world decides that we need to focus in on drug and alcohol addiction and mental health associated with people who are struggling with homelessness, let's go there first. That's fine. Let's figure that one out, and then we'll have enough energy and momentum with that community of support that we can move on to children next. So for me, it's about reciprocity and trying to understand who's in the room, who cares about what, and trying to get along well enough to take that, that next right step. That's from Frozen, because my kids watch Frozen. <laughs> Take the next right step. You know, Sarah helped me out today. I had gotten old and cynical, <laughs> and I thought that that old School of Rock video about how a bill becomes a bill yeah. didn't work anymore. I, did, I was dumbfounded when I heard her conversation. I'm watching your presentation. I'm whispering Michelle, saying, it can work. <laughs> well, thank you. It worked. You were able to make something happen through the legislative process. Anybody else shocked? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm renewed. Yeah. Thank you. And, so I guess so the question is, is, is when you're building this out, are you thinking of different groups you're, you're, you're needing? Or are you thinking mental health? Because we're such, such a de deficit in general. Yeah, there's such a deficit <clears throat> in general. But the concept of excuse me, um, the way the rural board wanted to think about this and implementing the work of Be Here is that we also kind of move towards tailoring some of our initiatives <clears throat> based on the five regions. Yeah. So, sorry, hold on a second. <clears throat> I'm fighting it. <laughs> I'm going to win. Um, <clears throat> So what we might find out in the rural areas as far as what their big workforce need is might look quite different than what the Clark Regional Board might say is their big workforce need. So as we kind of build ourselves out, that would be the idea is to work on a little tailoring. Um, but I think there's just some general 
areas we can start with across the whole state with that. So, and uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, what could we do at the state level? I do just want to put in a plug for the state um, <clears throat> through Department of <clears throat> Human Services has just released their new Silver State Health Improvement Plan. So I'm not sure if everyone has seen that. That just came out in the past couple months, yeah. but they're laying out a roadmap for Division of Public and Behavioral Health and the community to work on areas of social determinants of health, access to health care, mental health and substance use, and um, building the public health infrastructure. So there is an attempt there at that state level to try and coalesce around some general um, goals and a roadmap forward. And is you know a lot this better than all of us, I think. Is there funding federal dollars tied to particular constituencies when you're going out for grants? Um, there are. So, you know, certainly the ARPA funds um, were really targeted toward a lot of things with COVID. But even before the pandemic, there was a lot of money going towards opioid use, and that's still ongoing. So from a lot of money coming through still from these settlements um, with the pharmaceutical companies, so that was already an area that was getting a needs continued attention and a lot of money flowing through that. Um, there's more money coming out from the federal government focused on children's mental health, on school-based mental health care. So I do see that there, are, there um, are pockets of specialty areas with funding attached to it. Okay. And some states do better than other states in facilitating and funneling these funds. And one of the real tragedies is that federal funds don't get spent. Uh, the infrastructure isn't there to spend it. There's not enough people connected. Uh, you can run into a situation where some of these funds would have to be given back. Uh, and I feel that one real tragedy would be that the federal dollars that you all have have created can't come and can't be spent when the needs are so great. Uh, and that's not a blame to the legislature. It's really a systematic, yeah. it's a systems issue. And I, 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 did, I did I steal your, your no, question? No, yeah, it's a perfect segue, Paul. Okay. Um, so as, as many of you are aware, unfortunately, at the last IFC meeting, um, this, the state line lawyers decided to take back about $23 million in previously appropriated uh, federal dollars, including some funding for, all this was in the health area. Yeah. All of it was, and some of it was, was mental health intervention, and it just sort of goes that capacity issue that you were talking about here. So this is obviously a concern for Nevada. We do poor getting these federal dollars. Right now we have a lot of federal dollars and we're not able to appropriate them or get the money to, to where it needs to go. Um, that's a whole nother conversation, of course. Um, but if you were, you know, all of you, if you were uh, sitting on the IFC, where would you say, where do we put these money in? Do we give it to Sarah, we give it to Michelle? Um, you know, what, what's the best use you think, because this money has to be spent quickly. I, I, I love spending money. So but the question I would ask, for anybody in the audience, how many watched the IFC meeting? So we have a few people. There was a few key components in that meeting. And legislators were texting me as it was happening, saying, are you watching this? This is crazy. <laughs> um, because there's conflict between the governor's office and legislature. There's conflict between staff and the legislature. But there were two key things that were said. So um, I don't know if anybody else picked up on this, but there was a senator that said, we want to see a plan. And then you had staff that say, we'll come up with a plan. So that right there is an opportunity. That's, that's a whole bunch of money that they don't have a plan for yet. And the state has a whole bunch of opportunities with funding. And they have staff. And if you know the state really well, there's about five people that make decisions around funding in the state. If you know those five people, it's really easy to access them and say, let me help you come up with a plan. Because they're, they're overtaxed. They're overburdened. They're dealing with immense statewide systems. They have immense responsibility and authority. And it's a lot easier for them to cut and paste a plan than it is for them to come up on their own. So I saw an enormous opportunity with that IFC meeting, and I think there's senators and assembly people that desperately want somebody to organize and say, this is how to spend money. This is the system that we want to create. The challenge is, is in our community, there isn't an organization that comes and does that. Yeah. And so people are fumbling around trying to figure out how best to serve the state with the, the experiences and knowledge base that they have. 
Here's your pitch, Sarah, make it. Um, yeah, so uh, of course I think um, any, I'm looking at again, so many mental health professionals in this audience who could say, yeah, I, I could use a little bit of that and implement it. Um, and I think I'm gonna kind of pivot a little bit and go back to, I think, why Beacon got $25 million from their state legislature to say, put it out towards behavioral health workforce. And I think it was because of that infrastructure. They had already been in existence for so long. They were showing you know, proven results. And so they were a trusted partner, I think, to their legislator to say, to the legislature to say, we recognize that um, we need to really bolster our efforts on behavioral health. Do you have some ideas? And they said, sure. We would take that money and I think direct it towards four program, four different um, funding opportunities, behavioral health training, expanding telebehavioral health in the rurals, um, funding COVID-related treatment programs or research programs, and expanding supervision, um, which is a big need in the rural areas. So because of that infrastructure was there, it was a trusted partner, and they had the receipts to say, yep, we can spend money wisely and show results that worked well for them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that some states like Nebraska have the advantage of being is that in Omaha, there's something called the University of Nebraska Medical Center, UNMC, and it's the only one like it in the state, and there's one university system for the state. And what happens is in some states, uh, the one land-grant university or the other land-grant university, and sometimes people don't know who is and who isn't, um, often at that point become in conflict and they don't have that direct pathway to the governor's office or the legislature. So in Georgia, for instance, the University of Georgia is very close with, uh, through Sonny Perdue and through the governor in Georgia. I'm working there right now. And they're able to go right away with the plan. In fact, it's so symbiotic in places like Georgia and Nebraska and Ohio and some of the other places that they don't have to wait and say we don't have a plan. The plan was already there. They knew the ball was coming. They're ready to catch the ball. They know that a plan is needed and the money's there. And here, <clears throat> it seems like, in, uh, as we go back to our past history, some conflict always between uh, who's the hub and who's the spoke. And I want to give Sarah a compliment. Involving the folks up north as much as you can lowers that temperature that it's just a UNLV win at the expense of someone else. So it's a win for everybody. Uh, so I think just knowing how to play that game and doing it the best you can, uh, the, the states who get the most money are the ones that play the game the best. Yeah. And we need to play it a lot better. Um, let's see. So you know, right now we have federal money on the table. We had a robust state budget. Um, what happens down the road, right? When the federal money is no longer available, our next economic downturn, state coffers are not quite so robust, right? How do we sustain this? Where does that responsibility lie? I, I think it, I mean, if Michelle took ownership of it, so it's Michelle. <laughs> Dr. Hall, you, you're the one with this viral bound plan, so it's all on you at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think from my perspective, as an elected official, like you're, you, you get lobbied all the time. It's super easy to build a football stadium. It's super easy to get a baseball stadium built. You can get all kinds of things built if someone's organized enough to tell you which direction to go in. That's, that's the same at the local level, at the county level, at the state level. If someone's organized enough to say this is the right next step, then elected officials are usually apt to go towards the next right step. Healthcare in particular, because I've spent the last five years working in healthcare, um, the healthcare community is fragmented, is fighting constantly. If the, on the mental health side, if they can come together and, and there's no fighting, there's no territorialism, there's everyone is agreement, I think it's an easy next step to take. And I think we can build out in Nevada. I don't think it's hard to build out things in Nevada. You can go very fast in Nevada because there's only five people to make decisions. <laughs> so if you just get those five people in a room and say, here's where we're going and we're all aligned and we're not gonna come stab each other in the back later on and we're gonna take this next right step, elected officials are generally like, this makes sense. There's no one that's gonna fight us on this. 
Oh, gosh. I, so I'm sitting here thinking, like, funding for mental health. And again, my fellow colleagues out in the audience, please correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it just seems like we fund a lot of mental health with grants, with temporary funding sources. And so that is the constant fear. What happens when the money runs out? And so I, again, I go back to Nebraska and look at the stability of the state investment. You invest in what you value, and they invest year after year in this workforce development center. And so I'd love, I don't know what that looks like. Um, you know, when we go for these grants at the state level, we're all supposed to put in there, what's our sustainability plan? And the answer is always, well, we're going to bill Medicaid. <laughs> but I'm sure Medicaid is sitting there like, well, you don't have unlimited funds. So, so I, don't, I don't know. I'm, that's not my expertise, but it, that's the frustration in mental health. No, you, you bring up a, a, a good point about our grant. And, it, and one of the things we do struggle with is where's the buy-in at the local level? Where's the buy-in at the state level? Or we'll do something, put in a grant, we don't get it, we put it back in the drawer. And we don't continue working on that. So say, look, we, got, we heard you, federal government, we heard you grant, granting um, agency. We're still going to do this, and we'll be back next time. And I think that's something we need to mature at. A lot of it's an economic design problem. And we know on the fiscal side that if you take care of people's hearts or we take care of their, their bones when they're broken, you can make money in hearts and bones. And you can make money in, in cancer treatments and, and subspecialty care. Uh, but that's only looking at half of the economic design model. That's looking at the profit that healthcare can make uh, and that's why we have a $5 trillion healthcare system, because it's profit-driven. Uh, but we need to help articulate the other side of the equation. What's the economic cost to our system of having behavioral mental health issues? What's the cost to every one of us to have homelessness and addiction and, and the other, and absenteeism? And we, we do studies that show how much it costs every one of us for folks not to finish high school. And they're published and they're out there. But we have to have a system where we start to communicate better what the social and economic return on investment is of these kind of things. Now, the best part about this issue is the numbers are so in our favor when we think about what, it's, what it saves uh, taxpayers and save society and adds to our community longevity, adds to our, our productivity, it, we're better, we're, we're more productive. It really makes the whole economy, we're probably leaving two trillion on the table in our national economy just from our mental and, and behavioral health status. Uh, but, but how do you do that? Well, that's what I've tried to help, but I need other people to help tell that story too uh, the economic design of health needs to be talked about. I, I would jump in. I, Could you use the pronoun as we need to do this? It's really important to define who we is because the we is there's nobody that talks about it. You have to figure out who is that person that's carrying the message. Um, and I, I want to just talk quickly about Medicaid reimbursement because that's it's such an important topic in this in this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, in the presentation earlier, the work that you're going to do at, at Battleborn. Um, and trying to connect families to resources. So I'm a family, I'm, I'm not at Battleborn, but I have enormous access, like it's crazy the access that I have being an elected official. For my son to get services, I was on a waiting list for nine months. That was across the board with multiple providers. That was the fastest with all of the different providers, with all the connections, all the resources. And the reason that, that I found, because I started off with insurance, and then I found through talking with a lot of people that a, a lot of you all folks went to cash pay only. That is a massive conversation point with an elected official, with a, with a state who's responsible for a system where they can't track all their providers because they're not going through Medicaid, they're going to cash pay only. Mm -hmm. And so that's a real, a real conversation to say from the economic impact, how do we make sure that the state is aware of all these different providers that are, that are billing and reimbursing and creating a revenue uh, source within our community because right now cash pay is is only affecting a very small percentage of our community and there's enormous amounts of need in our community that we aren't aware of at all. Before I turn over to some audience questions, I just want to follow up with you because I think you, know, you see this at, at, at the local government level, right? So you, know, you, you have a housing department, you have a department to deal with with homelessness, you have a department to deal with this and this. Is mental health a thread that runs through through all those 
you know, those people needing those services, how do you make those connections at, at the level of government, at a, in, a, in a government? Um, what, what I've learned from my working with, with my eight-year-old is you have to meet them where they are. So I, I don't need to talk about mental health with police officers. I don't need to talk about mental health with firefighters. I don't need to talk about mental health with people who are working with the unhoused. I need to meet them where they are and talk about the issues and challenges that they're experiencing with those caseworkers. That they don't, they don't need to think about the mental health challenges. We need, to, we need to think about it differently. We need to connect systems because it, it crosses the, the bridge mm -hmm. and you need to be able to connect all those systems and weave in mental health at the appropriate places and times. But police officers don't, don't want to talk about mental health. They understand it's an issue, but they have one specific job. Their job is not to counsel somebody out of a crime. That's somebody else's job. And so it's trying to figure out how to place mental health appropriately into all of those different systems in a way that makes sense. Yeah, those intervention points are key. Um, we have a few minutes left. We would like to open up to, to audience questions. I think Ashley has the uh, the roaming microphone. So if any would like to ask our panel um, any questions, we'd like like to hear from you. You guys have been sitting patiently. Oh, we got Sandra. <laughs> here, I'll stand up here and smile. <laughs> so, um, one of the things is I've been working with Sarah for a long time, trying to figure out what was the right formula to get it through the legislature. And I will say she is stubborn and does not give up. <laughs> and that's why she and I get along well. But she kept saying, okay, I'm going to change this this time. I'm going to change this. She kept just changing things. I'd go to this board. She would go to that board. She called it to Marino um, Airport after she got done talking to Winnemucca, and they go to yes. And I think she had a beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? She's like, they said yes. And she was so happy. And we were happy because we were on Zoom, and she was trying to tell us. But the thing I noticed this last legislative session that I've never seen before, notice that she had the pictures of unanimous, everybody voting, yeah. was we had legislators that in the past would vote anything that had money, they said no. <laughs> anything with money, they said no. And one in particular, I remember we were, they were doing the bill on making sure that homeless youth could get an ID. And I thought, when he raised his hand, I thought, oh, here we go. <laughs> He's going to be a no. And he said, why aren't we getting everybody an ID? And then everybody said, what? And he said, it's my brother, too. He said, my brother is, is mentally ill and homeless. It's my brother, too. And I think post-COVID, you're more likely to have legislators say, it's my family, too, and not feel like it's a stigma and that they're going to vote for it. That's excellent. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think I'll be OK without the mic. Well, we uh, need it for the recording, though, actually. Uh, Thank you. My name is Dan Ficklora. I'm the uh, Clinical director at Bridge Counseling, Nevada's only Southern, Southern Nevada's only certified community behavioral health clinic, also on the governor's commission. Um, community behavioral health, so important. We're all talking about community behavioral health all the time. But the professionals in the industry, I see some good faces in the, in, in the crowd, but our interns and our students are being pushed towards private practice, towards that cash pay model, because that's where the money is. What can we do at the state level to incentivize clinicians to start their careers in community behavioral health in the Medicaid clinics, the, the integrated clinics, and then stay there and make a career out of it? Because those of us that are there are doing it out of, out of a passion, out of a, out of a labor of love, not because of the dollar signs, not because we can support our families really well in that industry. Um, so I don't know what efforts are going on in this, in this movement to support people working in the communities that are underserved. Yeah, that's a very good question, and good to see you, Dan. Um, so I think one of the things that always gets brought up at this point is, oh, student loan repayment programs. So certainly that can be attractive. Um, so in those cases, um, and there's, of course, the National Health Service Corps loan repayment program at the federal level. We've got our state level, and then we're going to be adding another state-level loan repayment program through Assembly Bill 45 out of the last legislative session um, through the state, of, uh, the state treasurer's office. So th those are great ways to attract um, students that are coming out and about to start paying student loans that if you work in these settings, which are traditionally those community-based mental health clinics, Medicaid-serving, um, offer sliding scale fees, and you agree to work in those placements for a number of years, you'll get this amount of your student loans forgiven. Um, that's always been the go-to talk. I think in recent conversations, as we've been kind of doing this listening tour um, with the different mental health training programs, is the need for 
can we lay that groundwork earlier and fund scholarships as well? So just to get students in the door to our training programs, we don't have a lot of great scholarship opportunities there. Is there some way to um, use that as an incentive? But I also think that um, in the higher education land, um, I, I, I know that there is some of this belief that maybe our education programs are promoting private practice. That's where you want to go. I don't know that that's necessarily true. But as we start working more with our mental health training programs, we'll, we'll have those conversations with them. But I think that's part of what we can do better at the higher level is making sure our students understand the wide range of how, where they can work, how they can work, and have that be very fulfilling work to them. So there's work to be done at that at different levels. Um, that, that's my thoughts on that. But I, I know it's a very important ongoing conversation to have. And I, I would just I point out that the state of Nevada right now is going to go through uh, unprecedented economic growth just because of all the stuff that we've been doing along the strip primarily. We will hit a downturn at some point, but going into the next legislative session, they're going to have a higher amount of money than they've ever had before, general fund dollars. And so when you're saying who's going to advocate for that, whatever that sustainable model is for people to go into community behavioral health, who is it? Someone's got to go out and there's money there. So go out and say it. My guess is the sustainable way is Medicaid reimbursement rates. And Medicaid isn't a hard no. They're just, we got to figure out how to do the math. And so if you can help them with the math, if you can help them understand why this is a priority, because it pays off dividends in other places, because if you take care of some of these challenging populations that your bridge counseling has to work with, that there's better economic return later, the math is there. We just have to help Medicaid get to it and help legislators understand that's why that's something they need to support. And there's no better time than when you have unprecedented economic growth. Yeah, I would say, and definitely, we have a competition between the private and the public sector. Um, one of the ways to think about this is that there needs to be more funding in the system, better reimbursement in the system so wages can go up in, the, in that setting. One of my daughter-in-laws makes 90,000 a year as a celebrity influencer dog walker. She walks dogs for 90,000 a year. Um, it's all app. <laughs> she makes a ton of Christmas and Easter. She's always late for the big holiday dinners because she makes more than a physician on holidays. Um, what happens is there's so much app ability to be an Uber dog walker or a app I don't know, it's a, some name, Fido or whatever the app is. And the cash that you can get in this world now to do services and to be a freelance dog walker um, is amazing how much money you can make. So we could sit here and say, how can we get people from not being celebrity cash only providers and say, we're gonna lose our public system or we can say, you know what, we have to strengthen our public system and provide other benefits to people. And loan repayment is one. But another thing is professional development. Uh, I have been a real big fan of the, some of the programs around the country that really tie the professional development back to the ecosystem because the lone wolf dog walkers that are just taking the cash are isolated and don't are not building anything. They're not really build, building a career, and they're not connected to some of the other things we get in life when we're connected to a professional community. So let's not think, forget about the asset that we get in being part of a community besides the pay, but let's not then make an excuse for the pay and not be able to feed our families. And I bring Chandler up because uh, of all our kids, I think she's the highest paid of any of our uh, seven, uh, five of our own and uh, collectively plus the spouses. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I, oh, yeah, a couple more questions. Hi, everyone. Um, 
I'm the director of community engagement. My name is Pearl. I'm with a local nonprofit organization called Puentes, and we partner a lot with UNLV a lot. Um, but I was just adding to your comment um, with Bridge Counseling. Um, we work alongside the managed care organizations, and just within the last month, United Healthcare. <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little sick too. I'm fighting the cold. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm okay. <laughs> I have a huge cup right here. Um, but United Healthcare, a uh, health plan of Nevada Medicaid, just lost their whole behavioral health team. Um, so what does that look like? That's affecting a huge population that has that need. And I think Molina, their team was cut a few months ago. Silver Summit is very small staffed. So why would anyone want to look into that field if it's not sustainable? So what can we do to ensure that those managed care organizations just retain that funding and even NAMI and so Solutions of Change, different community-based organizations are just throwing small grants here and there and it's not really long-term. So unfortunately, that's a huge issue. So I'm just letting you guys know that from a community perspective, it's very lacking. <laughs> so. I, I appreciate that comment and I, I know that's the case. And so in when I'm thinking about, and I don't have the answers, unfortunately, but, but when I think about workforce development, from K through 12 through practice, then the insurers have to be a partner in that workforce development. Do, how do they see themselves as a partner in this workforce development? Um, and I think that's gonna be how do we pull them into this ongoing conversation because they have to see themselves as part of this workforce development that when we graduate these students and we've got them hooked into, yes, I wanna stay here in Nevada, I see my life here, and I'm gonna take insurance, then they've gotta be a good faith partner with us on that, that that student can develop their, their, their living, um, you know, pay their bills, pay their student loans, grow their families here because there will, you know, we've got good partnerships there. And I think that's still a gap there from pipeline insurers. There's, there's, we've got to close that gap. Oh, that's, that's my best response at this point in time is I, I see that they've got to be a partner in this. Let's go one, one more question then. Uh, the panelists and the other person will be happy to stay after and, and answer any questions. I don't want to waste time because I don't know if this is necessarily <laughs> a question, but my name is Aubrey Glover. I am a I'm recently licensed intern for MFT. So I work at Healing with Grace Counseling Center. So I feel like I can give a unique perspective, I guess, because I just came out of school in October um, with my master's degree. And so, and I don't, I realize that I am super, super privileged. So I don't know how many people share my perspective, but with like the community health centers, right now I am working in private practice. I just happened to be where the internship was available. But I know just from stories I've heard from colleagues and, and um, students that I went to school with, community health is not really pushed a lot of times because of our own mental health. They're worried about being overrun and burned out so fast that we can't even get started before we get burned out before we're even started. Mm -hmm. So, um, and thankfully I say I'm privileged because I have a husband who has a great job. I'm not really in it for the money at all. I've wanted to do this since I was 16. So I'm 20 years after my bachelor's degree, I went back and got my <laughs> master's. But um, so I don't know, I, I'm just sharing my perspective that I think that it's community health. I think what you were saying with like continued education and like even though as an intern we're not required to get CEs, it's there are certain amounts that are going towards the licensing board like even coming to this, you know, that stuff for me is huge because like my supervisor said that I just bought the most expensive piece of paper there is and now I start learning, <laughs> you know. So and that's how I feel. I just feel like yeah. I should know everything and I know nothing. Like it it has to continue the training and the the special I really want to go into postpartum to perinatal health um, work. And so, yeah, just extra training, funding for training, and um, making sure the community resources are providing that extra training for the newbies that are coming in. So, Thank you for sharing. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming today, for your patience and, and for, your, for your engagement here. I think, obviously, the, the two big takeaways for us today are you know, you want to be faculty hear the need um, and are responding in, in creative ways here. But just to, to reiterate the, the key point here, like every one of these programs is through grant, philanthropy, or one shot funding out of, out of, out of legislature. So the sustainability issue is, is the big piece of the puzzle here that we need to keep working on. 
hopefully we can get this in place as long when the money's there, um, and then and they can't cut it down the road. I think is the goal there. So um, that, I think that that's where we need to move forward. Just a reminder: if you are doing CE credits for this, please uh, make sure you sign in, get the certification, make sure you pick up an agenda. Also, there's a lot. We have our fact sheets out there. There's some other uh, materials out there. Please take those. Um, they're there for you as well. And if you have not had enough of Greenspun Hall, please come back next Tuesday night. Uh, we'll have our last uh, Brookings Scholar out uh, lecture here. The Catherine Meyer will be speaking on uh, higher ed access there. So thank you, and thank you to my fellow panelists. Thank wonderful. You thank you. Thank you. Thank you.